<laughs> this song is so fucking good. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> it's so hype. Let me uh, reach my microphone really quickly so my levels aren't completely skewed. Uh, yeah, that's okay. That's alright. That's alright. Okay, we good. Uh, head over to the irregular music on the stream. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed all of that. Para, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Good to have you in here early. Got to do a study and then uh, continue working on that W Lop thing because I had to do a bunch of changes. It's basically going to be a new piece, so it's going to be fun. I've already learned quite a few things, a lot of exciting information to share, and uh, let's do an armor study first. Hopefully we can get into that before we get into anything else. But I welcome you guys to our second stream of this week. This is Tuesday, seventeenth, in the week of September two thousand and nineteen. We're almost at that twenty, almost at that big old twenty twenty. The clearest of vision, but it's fine. We're still out here. We're still getting the work done. We're still getting the studies in. We're still improving as people, as artists, growing. Hopefully, make our mark at some point or the other. All right, so let us switch over views. Nas, how's it going? Good to see you. You'll be uh, happy to know that your face is way, way bigger in that piece that we're doing. Uh, but uh, it's going to be interesting. Where have I left that piece? Let me show you really quickly, because I'm sure you guys are interested. At least I hope you are. Let's, uh, let's open that. Hopefully this is the piece. This could be something else. Please don't be, please don't be not safe for work. Please don't be not safe for work. What are you? I should name my pieces properly. Okay, this is a, this is where I left it last stream. That's SSA. And we have a new one. Yes, Lopez and the artist on Instagram. Bumblebree, good to see you as well. Para, how's the work been? How you been getting along? This is not the file. Excuse me? Oh, you know what? This is actually the file. I just didn't toggle the layer. So I brought it up to... Uh, I brought it up to here. So this is what it looks like currently. Uh, so some changes, some improvements. Really uh, testing out... Uh, and seeing really what makes the style and what doesn't. I think I've gotten a few things out of the way that I was a little bit uh, a little bit concerned about. I think I've somewhat figured out the armor. The main thing that I'm kind of figuring out is um, just how to get a mid-level softness on the clothing element, which I kind of figured out down here, so I'll transfer information. Sorry about my dogs. Uh, I'll put it up there as well, and of course do some background rendering. Just a little bit of a note towards the background. I think I'm going to be changing the lighting in this piece entirely, and I'm going to backlight this piece. I'll backlight the entire piece. Because just taking a bit of a census on his work on our station Instagram, uh, DeviantArt, very seldom, very seldom do I see strong directional lighting. I do see it in a couple of pieces here and there, but when it comes to his storytelling, he has this huge habit of blocking his characters in with dark and kind of sticks with the generally dark palette with some very, very soft light uh, towards the side uh, towards the side of it. So, and some very extreme light on the rim lights, which means that the light's usually hitting on the back and there's some reflectance from the front elements hitting on the front. So that's the kind of idea that I want to play with. And it'll be interesting for you guys to see as well, because lighting is one of the big, big things that you're like, oh, Jesus Christ, I can't change the lighting now, it changes the entire piece. And you're right, um, but I do want to see if I can do it. So I, I have no guarantees of if I can do it or not, but I do have a lot of ways in my mind that it's possible, so we'll try and explore some of those. That pink hair is perfect? Well, you will definitely like it, Iris, because that pink hair, this entire character is based on your your buddy. That's, that's <laughs> Will the Beef right there. That's Will's uh, female persona, Wilma, and I have transformed her into a princess. So uh, yeah, a lot of the proportions are gotten. I got from uh, this little character. I hope you see some amount of resemblance. Uh, otherwise, I've done my job poorly. Also, I don't dig the yellow light. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I don't like it very much. This yellow light was just a kind of like an artifact from when I was just messing around with the color and I just stuck with something. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't know if I really like it all that much. It's a little bit too saturated, I think is the problem. It's a bit too yellow. I would like it to be a little bit more pale, a little bit more tail, uh, tail, tame. That would be nice. Um, just a bit more uh, in that direction. And I would like to bring out some more blues um, in the shadows. So right now the shadows read really uh, desat. Like it's very desat shadow right there. It's not even desat. Look at the colors right there. Uh, these shadows are heading into the red, I mean, there is temperature change, which is the point, right? We have warm lights and cool shadows. That's relative warmness, relative coolness. We have that established. However, I would like to push this in a slightly different direction. I want this to be brought into more of a desaturation. 
and I want this to be brought into more of a mild saturated blue or a mild saturated cyan. That's what I would prefer it to be. Because that to me is a more appealing kind of color set and I would like to see it in the piece. I would like to have that relative coolness. Um, so the palette's a little bit uh, a little bit weird. Also, I did change the background. I got rid of the streak because it was making the read a bit too harsh. And that's another thing that I noticed. So oftentimes when I'm doing pieces, I'm focused on the idea of having the subject matter be so clearly defined, but you don't really need all that much. And that's what I'm really trying to, um, that's what I'm really trying to do here. So uh, initially I said, I'm gonna have this crazy background in here, which looks like this. So like a street background, right? There's some overpainting here, but some a street background going through the entire piece. Like that was the idea, right? The initial idea. Um, but it turns out that the read is just way too harsh and I don't really need it. So I cut it off and the read is still there. In fact, it looks way more unified like this because that streak going through the piece was a little bit too much. So it's been relegated to a slight area on the top right. And indeed, we might bring everything back. I might change everything so the background is a very, um, very dull, desaturated blue, but blown out as it was atmospheric. Uh, it was, it's like an atmospheric blown out sort of desat blue color and I'll have that shine a rim light around my characters and maybe that's going to be a much better idea for the piece. Also the biggest change you guys will notice that I made with the piece is I completely uh, amped the cropping. So the initial crop is this, it's really really far away and I did, did like this just because Lop is a character focused artist and when I was detailing the face I realized that wait a second, just the face occupies so little space on my canvas that like I could barely do anything with it and have the have the changes be impactful. Even this, for example, I have been heavily debating increasing the cropping of this as well. I kind of like the framing of the spears in this particular piece, which is why I've kept it this way. And I think it's a, it's a decent separation. This could easily be um, like a mid-level panel, for example, if this was like a graphic novel. Uh, it's okay. However, we could really amp this further, right? So like there's nothing that really stops us from like amping the crop in the middle and then just bringing all of this higher so we could make it even more character focused by doing this, right? I'll let it load for a second. Oh, my computer's done. <laughs> it doesn't like my uh, my change apparently. You got the inspiration from... This, this kind of looks even more cinematic, right? Like a, like a still from a movie almost. So it's definitely possible, right? Of course, compositionally, it doesn't work all that well. I would lower everything uh, a little bit, but it still looks cool, right? It still definitely looks like a, it looks more like a story moment and less like the other things that we've been doing uh, on the stream. Because like I said, one of the biggest things that I'm learning from the artist is that it's important to capture narrative elements more than just kind of show characters and show design. It's important to show story as well, because it gives you like this, level of like hidden intrigue that you don't really tap into generally speaking for a lot of pieces like like look at that cropping that looks that looks like it could could be from anything right like that looks so much more complete it's so much more character focused like we could go ahead and just do it this way and nothing really stops us because like, like my one concern is i want to keep the faces in here on the characters towards the side but like this seems like a much stronger piece of work it looks like it's embedded much more than what we had initially like, would you guys agree because like the, the change we just made was um I'm gonna show you was that we went from that to this and i do think it's a better change i do think that everything occupies the canvas way more i think it's a you know a much more interesting shot it's uh, it's kind of cool which the, the bad thing about it is that it sucks that we don't have this element of all of this happening here but the thing is when i drew the composition like this i didn't consider whether i wanted the piece to be a character based piece or just this widespread the panorama of what's happening because how can you have a character focus when the character is this small occupying the, the, the frame, it doesn't make any sense, right? So I didn't ever consider this question when we did the comp, but it definitely is a question. Because like I said, I do want this to be character focused, so it just makes sense for it to look this way. And now I have so much more room and so many more... This is actually a weird thing to say, but there's so many more pixels for me to work with, because legitimately I can show you uh, the amount of pixels on the face that I had to work with initially, it really wasn't all that much. So, like, look at the eye, for example. Like, what, what am I supposed to do with <laughs> with that? With that, I can't, I can't, I can't like differentiate between hardness and softness at this level. It's one of the biggest reasons why I blew it up in the first place. Um, but right now, like, compare this face, the size of this face, to the size of of that face, right? It's like a whole, it's a whole new world, a new fantastic point of view.
don't know. So there's some thoughts from uh, my work yesterday. Uh, it's kind of cool. Over sketch, good to see you. And yes, the inspiration was from Wilma. Did I miss something from Para? I'm trying out Out Outrage. It's a pretty neat, uh, really different from other apps I've used. Outrage, tell me about it. I have not heard about this app uh, just yet. I would agree. I think the shot is still successful, but this is stronger for all the reasons you listed. Yes, I think so. I think this would definitely work, the initial shot. Uh, again, for like a wide-reaching panel of sorts, I think it would be really cool. But yeah, I mean, this this cropping reminds me more of a vlog piece than the other one, right? Just in terms of like the, what you would expect. I will still be changing the lighting. It is something that I want to... I want to do it just because it's something that we can do. Because how many times have you ever changed the lighting on a piece, like dynamically? Have you just snapped your fingers and changed the lighting at any point? Mostly when I have to do that, I just restart the piece. I just restart it because it would save me less time. But I can't, I can't sit here and do that. That's, that's silly, because I like a lot of things that I've done already. I like the way the armor's been, I like the way that I've drawn certain things, I like the way I've rendered it and proportioned it and layered it. I like a lot of things about this piece. I don't want to abandon it entirely. Um, but I should also kind of figure out, because I'm not happy with the lighting. I mean, right now it kind of looks, kind of looks cool, I'm going to be honest with the cropping. Um, so I might keep it, but I still want to experiment around with it. But before that, let's do a study. Let's do a one hour study of uh, here, this golden armor. So I'm going to do it uh, very much like I would do it with the... Um, with this character over here, we'll do a character over here. So we'll keep it nice and soft on the face, nice and hard on the armor, just like we would for a vlog style. So basically what this translates to, if you want to make the work look a little bit more like what uh, the artist of your studying would, so aka okay, your boy senpai. So what, one of the biggest things that I've changed with the way that I uh, approach pieces is I didn't do a lot of this with intricate brushwork. So I did a lot of the face, for example, with the, that's the wrong face. I did a lot of the face with uh, with some brushwork in there, so some softness, a lot of blurring, a lot of airbrushing, a lot of graphite, um, graphite brushing to kind of get um, an interesting kind of facial blend. That was done. But if you look at the armor, for example, a lot of the armor is done very, very harshly. So I used um, so even though I said hard run brush. I found a lot more success using an angular static brush. So I use a brush like this, for instance, um, for a lot of the armor rendering. So I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. It's a brush like this. So a lot of the armor highlights happen to be something like that. So a really interesting arrangement of highlights like that. And it helps me build up the armor. So for instance, if you were supposed to do the plate right there, so the plate that, uh, that's on her, on her shoulder, it would be done like this. So we first kind of mark out what the proportions are going to be for that plate, kind of figure out where things go. So then you add your occlusions right underneath, because this will be the next step. You add the occlusions underneath to get the read, right? And you add some mid-tone values onto it, just like that, and just like that, right? And you can even be a little bit more general with the strokes. And the idea is that when you get to the stage where you put your highlights in, you slam those highlights in very, very unabashedly. So you just you slam it in like that. Right? With this kind of brush. Or you can even, for this case, I'd probably use a round brush because the highlight itself is a bit rounder. So I'd use a brush like this, for instance. And I'd pop it, pop it in there like that. So that's basically how you would go for the... Uh, for the read, and of course you'd manipulate things to make sure that you still have your metallic read by slowly pushing values, for example, say that I wanted this to be a bit more reflective, you can push it there, you can push it there, and then slowly but surely you build up this kind of really uniquely, like it looks semi-unfinished, but in the context of a finished piece, you kind of get a much better read. And it looks metallic, especially when it's in proper context. So already we're kind of building up a little bit of that metallic texture, and we're just using it using very, very hard strokes, so no blending whatsoever, uh, which is interesting because oftentimes when I'm in the middle of, uh, of rendering metal, I kind of like to do a little bit of softening in the middle, but it definitely will still read uh, if you do it this way. So I'll be doing a lot of hard rendering on the metal surface, and of course if I have time for the face, we'll make that nice and soft, but it should be perfectly possible in the time frame. We'll spend an hour on this, let's say. I'll really try and use, the, use my time well on this one, so hopefully we get a lot of work done. I'll do a slight little crop at the very beginning of the piece, and then we can get started. You should try the art rage demo at some point. It's supposed to emulate traditional painting, so it has models for thickness of paint and more realistic color blending. It smears and blends in weird ways. Totally alien to me, but it's so fun. It's fun so far. Interesting. So they're making an engine to emulate uh, traditional stuff. That's cool. Now I'm I'm um, I'm all for it. That sounds really cool. 
Uh, does the program cost anything? What are the requirements? Uh, does it require like a lot of hardware intensive stuff? Because fortunately, I'm not running my stuff on the best hardware. But we'll see. All right. So we're gonna get started in a couple of minutes. If you guys want to paint along, I do encourage it. You can find the reference on the Discord in the completed references panel. Okay, so again, we need to identify some really big things, uh, and this is more of a reiteration right now because we have done a lot of a lot of information about armor. But again, to reiterate the biggest thing, why does armor look like armor is the biggest thing that we have to talk about, and the reason is because of its reflective component is the biggest answer. And how do you how are you able to convey that in a piece or in uh, in whatever it is that you're drawing? So the first thing is you need to understand how things are structured, because if you understand the structure, you'll understand how it behaves with respect to its light source. So, for instance, if you were supposed to like break things down, so this little shoulder plate, it's semi-cylindrical, right? So if I was to simplify that shape heavily, it would be like this. So I have a cylinder like that, like a, a semi-cylindrical shape is how I would do that, right? It's how you would simplify that shape, because it's just this much of a semi-cylindrical. Just that much. So this is our shape in question. That's our armor plate. So that's the first thing that we do. We sort of identify what the actual topography is of whatever it is we're drawing, right? And then we apply value in a manner that it's consistent with the light sources that create light in the situation. So most of the time when you're doing any sort of rendering, uh, you just diffuse the light, you disperse the light, you say, okay, fine. So this plane is facing my light source, therefore this plane will get a lighter value in general. But what armor does is it gives you a very clear indication of what your source looks like. Okay, so for instance, if I had a source that was green on top, I would have a green light. If it's blue, I have a blue light much more clearly than you would for a matte surface, right? So a much more true representation. What's even more important than that is that the shape of whatever is caused in the reflection is also taken into account. Meaning, not, not just the shape, but the environment. So we'll keep it a lot more simple uh, for this idea. So we'll take, let's say, I think we can just take the same thing because we're already talking about it in this way. So we'll, we'll just isolate it. So basically when it comes to armor, you're drawing everything the armor sees, like, like you're drawing a mirror. So if there was a sun in the sky, you, you can't just consider the sun. You have to consider everything. So what do you see? Like what do you see as a person when you look up at the sky? You see the sun? right in the middle but the sun's not alone it's not sitting in a vacuum it's sitting with a bunch of bright sky around it right so the sky of course will be relatively a bit darker than the uh, than the sun but it'll still be there right it'll still be around so if this was skin let's say if this was skin so we have a, a layer of skin right over here and the skin was in the light if the skin was in the light then you would have you know, of course, it would go brighter, it would go more towards the color of the sun, and you would have maybe a brighter yellow color in the in the exposed light regions, right? But let's say this entire armor is exposed to light. What would it look like? Would you expect the same amount of yellow all across the piece? Well, no, because like I said, it's a much more truer representation of what the light source is. So when this light source strikes the panel, I don't get yellow everywhere. I get a representation of the sun right over there. Right? And this it, it's, a, it's a line instead of a circle because of the way it's structured. That goes into the way that uh, light interacts with surface. It's a different uh, thing to talk about. But you would get something like this. You would get a band of yellow. Not just that, but because the blue is like a secondary source of light, you get a true representation of that blue. Well, how true depends on the armor quality, depends on the, ref on the reflectivity, depends on the local value. But you will get some shift towards that. A much clearer shift than you would get for anything else. We start right over there. Right? And as you go more and more around the surface, you might hit some matte areas here and there. Let's say there's like a building on that side. And of course you have your heavy, heavy specular in the middle. And you have your specular highlights around. But this is really what makes armor look the way it does. Right, that's the fundamental right there. And there's so many things you can do for rendering. There's so many things you can do for finish, like you can throw um, like glow effects like that for example you can throw weathering on top of the armor to make it look a little bit more manageable a little bit more reasonable like, there's so many things you can do but that's really what makes armor look the way it does 
So you get a much more truer representation of the source, both in value and as well as the most important thing in terms of shape. Okay? So basically, if you understand the environment that the armor is in, you should be able to render the armor effectively and make it read like armor, right? So what that means, to, uh, what I mean to say by that uh, is, for example, if I had a red box right next to, so I'll draw it in perspective, uh, I'll attempt to draw it in perspective, but I'm drawing on selection tools, so it's a bit harder. I'll say a, a red cuboid right next to it. So if I had a red object, so we'll just make this object respond to the sunlight. So it's coming from, let's just say the top, the top right. So I have this object right here, right? In the scene. So because of the fact that this object is still a source of light, right? Because it's taken upon some quality of light, you would get the same red color. You would get it on the surface of the metal. It would reflect. You see that? So every source is realistically represented. Right? And of course, if the entire armor was blue, all of this would be blue shifted, right? Except for the, the main sources of light. There's some like caveats to this, some, like slight modifications, but this is what's really going to get you there. It's really what's, what's going to get you to, to believe that something is light armor. Because if you relate what I just said to this picture, what do we see? We see that she's indoors, clearly, because light is not sunlight. We also see that the light's probably an incandescent tube light, and there are rows of them, because there's rows of light right there, right? And also, we know what the color of the ground is because it's reflected over here. Like I said, even the ground now becomes a light source. Of course, the ground is always a light source, but we don't always consider it because objects aren't always reflective enough for you to merit that consideration. What that means is, to, like for example, when I was drawing her face, or if I was to draw her face, I don't immediately think, okay, she's in a, she's a, she has like a warm ground underneath her, it's going to create warm planes up here. Why doesn't it? Well, if this was metal, up on, if she was wearing a metallic mask, Yes, it would reflect over here, but skin is not reflective, it's the opposite of reflect reflective, it's matte, so M-A-T-T-E, which means that it's not going to take upon that secondary nature as much. So, 100%, if the floor was a different color, if the floor was white, you would actually see some appreciable amount of change on the face, but the change to the actual local color is not high enough for you to really consider that strong when painting the face. If her face was right next to the ground, perhaps, that's the proximal effect of light right there, but in general, we don't really consider the environment all that much, uh, especially the ground. We'll consider light sources like diffuse light, bounce light, and direct light on the face, sure. But that bounce light from the ground, not so much. If there's a red pillow or something, it's a red tower somewhere in the background over here, I'm not going to see that across the face. If there was a red ball right next to her face, yes, I would see a little bit of that effect over there. That's proximal effect. A light source becomes stronger the closer that it is. But when it's far away, the only thing that really will see it is your reflectance. Your reflectance are much more tractable and they will see it, right? That's the kind of idea. So, for example, if I had a ball of skin, had a ball of skin right here, just a ball of human flesh, you know, just as you do. Got a ball of skin right here, right? And I apply the direction of light source. So there's shadow coming from this side. So I'll just take the value and I'll, I'll drop the saturation, right? The sunlight is yellow, it's that color. So it shifts the, the skin into that yellow color right there, right? And the sky is blue, so it shifts the shadows into a blue color. That's your diffused light. I think I have some videos on that already. And then, because of how close this red ball is, I'll have a very slight effect on the skin of that red, of that red box. I have a little bit of an effect of that right over there. Right? If this was metal, I, this would be a completely different story. I would get something like this if it was metal. And I would not get this, I would get this. Well, there would be a highlight here, a very strong one. And there would be much deeper shadows. And this would be blue. You see how that instantly reads more like metal? And it instantly becomes more metallic to us, right? And of course, we can put more true values on here as well, so I can even do stuff like this. And suddenly, like, we get this metallic read from it, right? And that's really, that's the power of the fundamental right there. So we understand the way things react. 
So this may not necessarily read like metal, because what stops us from saying this is porcelain? What stops us from saying this is marble? Well, there again, there are additional things to consider. For instance, if this was marble, uh, the entire local color would shift warm, and in, in, in addition to that, the subsurface scattering in the piece, that would also go a bit warmer, so you would get subsurface, that is, that's like this almost. You get a little bit, what is the local value right there? Right there, so you go back, go down. So you get a little bit of this if it was marble. You get a bit of that subsurface. And of course the colors are wrong a little bit because marble is not deset. It's uh, going to have a mild warm. Well, it depends on the kind of, uh, kind of marble, but marble in general is going to be mildly warm. So you have a little bit of this if it was like marble because marble is not completely opaque. It's uh, semi-transparent, so it's going to have some light transmitting. That's your uh, your classic subsurface scattering right there. So subsurface scattering. Oh, just SSS. What's this? Just explaining uh, just some ideas about armor in general. Welcome, Sketch Tech. So just what? How do you draw armor? Why does armor look the way it does? Just going all the way through it. Just the uh, the most important things. And also uh, the last thing when considering armor is consider your occlusions. So we said that the reflections, we said that the effect of light is going to be much more truly represented onto the surface, uh, of the metallic surface. So what are the things that really amp our rain even more than that to get us more believable? Well, weathering is a big one, right? So weathering on the surface of metal, very, very, very possible. There's going to be tiny, tiny notches. And the notches are going to be way more evident than, let's say, imperfections on the skin, because the, the notches have the same metallic property. Right? The same metallic property you're saying, hey, I am also metallic, I also see a source, so therefore I'm also going to get some light. That's why notches are important, that's why imperfections on metallic surfaces are very, very much more evident. And the last thing is your occlusion. This is a really big one, by the way, especially in terms of drawing, in terms of the process. So putting these super dark occlusions is really going to give you a much more stronger shell when it comes to the surface of armor. So you see all the paintings that I've done of armor. So we'll go down a little bit. We have some armor pieces by me. So you see that that darkness is doing a lot. It's doing a lot for the piece. Because you don't have that extreme, extreme area of shadow on a lot of things. So your occlusions and cast shadows are generally going to be extremely, extremely strong uh, in terms of their value. They're going to be very dark. However, uh, in metals, it can be a great tool for you to kind of bring in some sense of structure. Because if you're painting and you paint without lines, sometimes it can be really easy. Thanks for the follow, Sha. Uh, but sometimes it can be really difficult. Like, for example, uh, when I was doing this particular painting over here, I was using a new brush set. I was using an oil brush set, right? That's why it looks kind of like an oil painting. But in the middle of it, I was like, oh, wait a second. This looks way too bendy. It looks way too uh, out there. It looks way too ambiguous. But metal is very, it's very solidly built, right? Thank you for the follow, uh, Greek Cruz. But the, the way that I always kind of come down on the armor, the, the way that I always make sure that it's a lot more specific, a lot more confined, a lot more defined, because armor is very regular of a shape, generally speaking, is I use those darks and I use the highlights. So I can use this as almost like uh, artificial lines. You know? Then on Studios, you're a streamer? Cool, I should uh, make sure to follow you if I can. Uh, do you have any work you want to you share? That'd be awesome. But see, the logic is, so we have some new people in here, so I can explain this again. Uh, but the main thing, right, the main thing when doing any sort of armor piece is just kind of evaluating what your light sources are. And you've got to think way more about the quality of your source than you would for skin, let's say, right? And the way that I explain that in terms of painting is like this, right? So I can do the exact same thing again if you'd like. Uh, I don't really mind. So it's like this, right? So if I was to consider... We'll just paint. We'll just paint a new sky, right? So we'll paint some light sources. So this, you kind of need to have some information about the idea. Name? My name? Is it, it's James. You can just call me James. That's my name. All right. So let's just consider really quickly. We'll go. What are the sources of color on a piece, right? Where does color come from a piece? Well, number one, you have these things called sources, right? You have the sun. You have the sky. You have lamps. You have all these kind of things. So the sources. So the source has something called, and this is fancy. But not that fancy. Color temperature. So color temperature means I have warm sources, I have cool sources. The sun is a nice, beautiful, warm, lovely source. Uh, the sun, while it sets, is a beautiful red, right? So it can be 
a warm yellow, it can be a warm red. So this is basically where color comes from, from the source, right? These kinds of ideas. And definitely link, link the website, yeah, I want to say. Right? So sources, that's a big reason. So you shine a red light on your face, your face becomes red, right? So it's a source. It, it does have something to do with the color. Number two is local color, big one. So some things are just generally predisposed to have certain characteristics of color. The, the physics behind it is that some things absorb a lot of wavelengths and only uh, radiate certain wavelengths, which means that's why we have red balls, green balls, blue balls. <laughs> a lot of us have blue balls. But um, that's why certain things have certain dispositions, right? So skin, for example, generally speaking, you can see my palette here. Skin's going to be around this region, right? You're not going to see people that have green skin by default or, you know, purple skin by default. You're going to have something over here, something over here, right? <laughs> White loves again. So local color, that's a big one. Three. Now, this is your interesting areas. This is like your semi, your, this is like what brings your work from beginner work to intermediate work, basically. So you have these big, big boys over here. You have diffused light. My handwriting can be way better, by the way. I'm sorry. My parents are both doctors. Diffused light. And you have bounce light. You have these players over here, and these are big ones, man. These are big ones. Because that's going to be the difference between your work looking flat and your work looking somewhat semi-advanced. And these are a lot of what's got to do with kind of rendering armor, just a little bit. So the idea is, is that let's just select some, some parameters over here. So we'll say that the source in our particular painting, so we'll say that the source, that source is going to be a yellow sun. We will say the diffused light is going to be a blue sky. We'll say the bounce light is going to be from a red box. And I'll say the local color is just a neutral. We'll just say this is a neutral gray. So I set up all the colors in my scene just now, right? So where does this take? So we'll just quickly keep all of our information here. And we'll get this out of the way. And we'll set the scene up, okay? And we'll do a, a ball rendering, let's say. Now balls are kind of weird, but they're kind of weak. Uh, for armor, we'll do an armor plate rendering. Right? So I'll set the scene up, right? So we said blue sky, right? So a lovely, bright blue sky, right? We just paint that in there really quickly. And we say there's a beautiful, bright sun in the middle of that. Just like that. Oh, the sun's gonna be a bit more blown now because of exposure. We'll just say this, you know, just really simple, really simple. And we'll say that we have our ground plane here. So we'll just draw a ground plane really quickly. That's the worst ground plane I've ever drawn in my entire life. Try again. Okay, so I'll put a ground plane in. Okay, and I'll put my box in. So I put a red box in here. Make that nice and saturated. Okay, fine. So. We'll apply a little bit of light in the box. We'll say the sun's coming from the top, so therefore it goes lighter and yellower on the top, right over there. Top plane goes like that, and you get a bit of a shadow. We got some cast shadow over there. We'll just say the cast shadow goes dark and blue. So we have this initial condition right over there. Really simple, pretty quick. Then we'll render out some metal. So we'll say there's a metallic plate right over there of a semi cylindrical form. So why does it look like a metal? What makes it look like a metal? So we'll start with a neutral color. Right? Neutral gray is the initial idea of this. And what makes this metallic? So again, it's going to have an effect from the environment. But remember, the effect of the source is so much, so much greater than you would expect. Because you see, this, this all the question you have to ask for a matte surface is to say, that, okay, what direction is my light source? Okay, the light's going to have some effect over here. It's going to be yellow. So you don't have to ask yourself too many questions. But with metal, because it's reflective, just like a mirror, you have to ask yourself so many more questions. You're not just showing me the vague idea of the light. You are straight up showing me what the light source is. Not just the light source, but all the light sources. So I have my sun. My sun is going to look like this, right? It's going to have a strip representing the sun, right? It's not going to be this because this particular point, this entire thing, like I said, is a mirror. So because of the cylindrical surface, it's extended like that. That's just how light interacts with the cylinder. But I'm not going to have this whole area 
be yellow because this is very possible if it was like a matte if this was skin for example or if this was cloth i wouldn't have just this much be the light source affected by this or the light affected by this i would have much more dispersed but metal like i said is like a mirror so i'm getting an image of the sky on this metallic surface so i get the same blue maybe not the same blue but an effect an idea of the blue i get that same idea over here right so i get that blue from the from the sky over there and i paint it right over here so see i'm getting like a a small representation of my surroundings with this right i have this red box towards the side of this that red box is going to have an impression it's going to have an effect on my metal right it's going to have a nice strong so i, I selected a neutral color so the amount of push is going to be quite quite high but just for the purpose of example it's fine so i have a red box right over there and i have this gray this gray floor right over there right so you see slowly but surely we're arriving at something that looks semi-metallic. I'll have an occlusion right over here on the bottom, right? I'll have a cast shadow underneath like that. It's gonna go darker. We can just blend that out really quickly. We'll have that kind of idea. I'll have the light source can be blown way more, so we could just say that this is going a bit more specular so we can see that it has that it's going to follow the rim because even the rim is metallic so the rim is going to get that light on it like that you see how we're kind of arriving at like something that's semi-metallic and we can always amp the effect by any of the stated the stated ideas that we've already said so like i said metal is imperfect there's so many little notches on metallic surfaces that we need to consider so for example you can throw in like these little tiny imperfections on the surface of the metal you can add in these little these little dots for example and say okay well this is going to be mildly reflective the metal has weathering on it it's not perfect it's got these dark spots these light spots you can do things like this if you'd like you can even amp the effect of it you can say that i want to throw a bit of atmosphere on there you can toss a bit of um a spec reflection on here and say oh it's going to be blown out that's metal right there bam it's shining in the environment right if i want to really amp the effect of it that's very possible. That's something that you can do. Right, and uh, you, you can even add um, a bunch of surface texture on top of that, right? So I can throw in like a mild amount of dirt, you can throw in mild amount of weathering, just really make it look like it lives in the piece a little bit more. Ideas like this. And of course, the nice thing about metal is that metal is manufactured, which means it's regular. This is not regular. I've not drawn it regular, but if this was a much more regular shape, it would look more metallic, it would look more structured. And also the fact that you can always take advantage of little details. For instance, most metallic parts have rivets on them or, or bolts or some sort of buckle, something like that, that attaches it to everything else. So I can say, let's just grab a dark value. I'll put some dark values here and here and here. And because metal being the way that it is, right? every one of these little bolts is also metallic which means it's also going to behave like a secondary source right it's also going to reflect which means that we can expect to see a very similar kind of array of value on those little because those are like tiny little spheres right there and even those are going to reflect so we're going to end up with something that looks vaguely metallic just by virtue of our rendering right so there's a reason why this looks metallic and that's the reason Right, a much more truer depiction of my sources, right? So I represent my bounce light much more. I represent my specular, my main light source much more. I represent my diffused light source from the sky much more. Because these things, they do have an effect on just general pieces. For example, if I was to place a sphere of skin in this environment, it would be like this. So I put the sphere over here. And now the, the logic is a little bit different. So let's say it's locally colored like this. It's just like, it's colored like this, for example. Thanks, Bri. I appreciate that. Very, very kind of you. I'll, I'll look at that link in just a second. Along. I'm actually really curious to see your work. Always, always happy to see other artists. Um, so this is how it works. So when you're drawing skin, when you're drawing anything, you say, all right, this is my, this is the shape of it. So I figured, figured out the shape. And we'll say the light is going to first hit this on the top, top left, we'll say. So the top left becomes what color? It becomes warmer because the sun is yellow and it becomes lighter because the sun is a source. And we, have, we get this color over here, right? And the shadow, we'll just amp it up. We'll say it's in the darkness. We'll just start right over here and we'll say it doesn't go saturated. We'll just say it's a darker value. Okay, just like that to begin with. 
Now, what are the other sources? We did, what did we do? We did one source. One source of light, which is this. But remember the sky, now this is a very big thing, and, and I didn't understand this until maybe uh, a few months ago, but the sky is also a source, right? It's also a source. It's a source of diffuse light. So the sky is going to have an effect on these shadow regions. So the shadow regions that can see the sky, because the sky, remember, is all around us. So the sky is a hemisphere. So there's a hemisphere of blue all around this piece. So I can do it a bit harder for you. So there's a hemisphere of blue like that. And the sun is right here. But there's blue all around this upper hemisphere. So what does that mean to us? That means that if I can see that hemisphere, if I can see that source, that source is going to have an effect on my sphere. And that creates the coolness that we always talk about. If somebody ever told you, like, warm light, cool shadow, half the time, the cool shadow comes from cool diffuse sources. Right? So we're going to have a slight effect to that. So it's going to go lighter and more blue. More blue can mean, you know, you can either just choose a blue or you can desaturate. A desaturated warm will read cooler. I'm going to have this effect on there. A very mild, very mild effect. I can amplify it if I choose to. But I'm going to have just a little bit of effect. Because, you know why? Because it's, it's skin. It's not going to have crazy, crazy amounts of uh, light balance. Of course, for a stylistic statement, you can say, well, fuck it, man. I'll put a, I'll put a crazy strong blue on there. If that's if it's, a, it's like a stylistic statement, you can easily do that. And I can put a little bit more blue on there. It's possible. There's no harm in it. And this bottom plane right over there, the bottom plane, is just going to have... It's just going to be darker. And we'll say it's more desaturated because it's in contact with... It's ground plane over here, right? And just like uh, the metal, this is also going to have a specular highlight, but it's going to be very, very imperceptible, right? Because again, skin, it's matte, right? Sure, you might have highlights a little bit on the nose, for, for example, but the highlight's not going to go crazy. The highlight's not going to be on a bed of much lower value. You're not going to have this crazy amount of a value shift for a highlight. It's going to be there, but not that much, right? And of course, some more properties of skin, if you want to go more in depth into it, we can say that skin has subsurface effects to it. Subsurface means light can pass into it. That's what subsurface is. So subsurface, sub meaning inside, surface meaning the actual structure, the actual surface, it goes in, inside and it scatters, subsurface scattering. Scattering meaning the light bounces all around. And when it bounces all around, the light will lose some of its energy. So this is the journey of the light source. So it goes, it goes directly on the metal surface or directly on the skin surface. It also goes around that corner. It, penetrates inside the surface it bounces all around and it comes out and it comes out as a as a beautiful beautiful warm so it'll come out as something like this so i choose that local value and i will warm it up bring that warmness in it goes slightly higher and i get a very very imperceptible amount of subsurface in there so i get this kind of transition which is why a lot of the times people tell you to saturate the transition on skin from shadow to light because a lot of the times you're going to be affected by subsurface right so you get this and you can even amp this up like i said i'm painting it very very con like conservatively but you can amp it up because you're an artist right you're an artist and you don't give a shit about just what the rules are in terms of moderation you want to excessively make a statement right a lot of people will do this look at dreamworks artists for example so i learned this from nathan fox he's a dreamworks artist uh, he has a great course in schoolism but they will amp this effect to the nines and they'll get this beautiful beautiful strong orange on there and you get this lovely beautiful saturated blue in the, in that, um, in the shadow regions you get this beautiful array of color right there which just looks so much more appealing right because what, what we're trying to do and if you ever wonder where this happens in real life kind of put your hand up towards the light source or look at somebody in bright sunlight when the light transitions from the area of light to the area of shadow some of the times in areas like the nose the ears the side of the face through your fingers you will see a bunch of redness because the light is transmitting through the object. So that's why you get these kind of shapes over there. And they are difficult to manage. It's not an easy thing to paint, but if you know your way around, it should be totally possible. And you'll see this in a lot of work, man. This is a lot of work. And it's a very cool thing to add because as a, as a creator, as a person that makes pictures, whenever you can do something justifiably to add more visual interest to your piece, that's something you should consider doing because who doesn't want visual interest? Nobody says I want to make an uninter uninteresting piece of work. You could say it becomes too interesting. That's definitely a problem because your piece can't be interesting everywhere. Then, then nothing is interesting. You know, syndrome from the Incredibles, if everybody's super, nobody is. If every part of your piece is interesting, then no part of your piece is interesting because interest is relative. All right, well, that's our little idea about, uh, about why metal looks like metal. 
So applying it to our visual our reference over here, it's because there's probably some lights in the um, in the so she's indoor. How can I tell? Because I can see there are areas of dark. Because you can basically you can basically see the ceiling over here. So there's a bunch of what what I'm assuming are either circular or cylindrical lights. Goes bam, goes bam. Another bouncing light from the ground. Yeah, you're right. It's gonna be underneath there. There's gonna be a slight bounce light. You are correct, sir. Then over here. You see that same idea? So we have a secondary source, just, just like this red box, we have the ground right over here, which is a secondary, so you're gonna have balanced light from that point, right? And again, every little one of these uh, surfaces is gonna be a little me like a metallic disc or a metallic surface. So like that's where structure comes into considered play, right? So if I know for a fact that this surface over here, it looks like it looks like a semi-cylinder, like that. That's the shoulder plate. If I know that this little disc, if I understand the structure of it, it's it's not just a disc, but it's if I was to draw this in profile, it would look like this. Which means that this plane faces down and this plane faces up. We see the exact same thing happen here. The, the, the plane that's facing upwards gets the effect of this light source. The plane that is facing downwards gets the effect of this light source, right? It's all consistent and that's the logic for metals. So if you're able to identify what the sources of light and what the objects are in your surroundings, you will easily be able to paint metal. And the more, the less uh, matte the metal surface is, and the less local color it is, you're going to see a much truer representation. For example, this is the color of the ground, and this is the color of the surface of the metal right there. It's, it's shifted because, again, the metallic surface itself is a little bit darker, but you see that saturation? That saturation almost, it doesn't dip at all. It's the same saturation. Which is cool, right? So undoubtedly, if you were to look at this girl from the back, for instance, you would see an effect of this yellow surface over here, this uh, wood paneling in the back. You would see this effect in the armor, right? If the ground was red, you would see that all over here. If the light source, if the light source was a bright pink, you would see a bright pink over here, right? So that's the idea. So logic of, of metal right there. And we just have to portray that on a canvas, and simple as that. We get to uh, we get to convey to the viewer that they're seeing uh, they're seeing metal. The idea. Hopefully that was interesting. But I usually do something like this every time I paint metal because it's really it's, it's really not that hard to understand. And once you start figuring that logic out and painting in a piece, everything becomes so much more easier. And metals are just such a great thing to put into pieces. I'm studying uh, Vlop right now, so WLOP, the artist. So uh, we're did a very quick uh, little painting, a little fix to the painting we were doing yesterday, and this is where we're at for that. Uh, but it's going really well, it's going really well. Uh, I'm going to change the lighting entirely on this piece, but it was really fun trying to figure out how he does his metals. But yeah, I'm always curious about process, I'm always curious about learning from artists, so you'll see me uh, do a bunch of style studies. But of course, this is how I usually paint. I do My style is like a blend between slight, it's a slightly abstracted realism. Um, I do like I do have I've learned pure realism and I do like painting in it. Um, but yeah, for my personal work, the only thing that I do is I abstract just a little bit, which is still technically realism because Sargent also abstracted, so. Little bit of impressionism in there. That's how I like to paint. This one I'll do with a bit more strict realism because I, I want to still experiment around with my brushes. But it's going to be fun. Yori, how to, how's, <laughs> how to see you? How's it going? It's good to see you. I like shiny armor, I think a lot of us do. Good to see you, Yori. So Yori and Narcissus in the chat, they're actually, I've used their faces for this character and this character, and I've used my friend Will's face for the central characters. So basically what you're seeing is, uh, is this, but in a fantasy setting. You're seeing this setup right here, the triumvirate. <laughs> kind of cool, right? <laughs> Thanks for shout to Will. Will is the, uh, the central one. And Nos is also a streamer, I believe, so make sure to follow her on that Instagrams. Oh, hi, Will. <laughs> yeah, so this is Will, Princess Will, the trap queen right there. I've never tackled metals, but you put it in a very logical way I can understand, so I may try. Yeah, definitely do it. It's really not that difficult. It's just understanding the how after a while. Well, understanding the, the how in terms of application, but the logic, the why it looks the way it does, it's not going to take you more than an afternoon. 
It's just figuring out like how to apply it and examples of that uh, is the idea. But yeah, that's uh, some of that logic. You guys thought that was interesting. Okay, let's paint this piece, huh? We'll paint it in an hour. So if you guys want to paint this, and if you are eager to apply what we just talked about, which is metallic rendering, I'm going to be painting this piece in an hour, and the reference is on the Discord. So I do encourage you, if you want uh, a way to apply that information, join me. It's uh, 60 minutes of your time, and I'm going to be doing it regardless. I'm going to fill up on some water, and we'll get started. Oh, also, we need to look at uh, Dedon's work. Dude, look at that sick loading screen, holy shit. Ah, oh, it's lovely, I like it. You see our uh, work picture. Sweet. I like the graphics. Dude, I can't make infographics worth shit. This is a, a very specific skill that's always in demand. Awesome stuff. Thanks for posting, that's awesome. I actually will, uh, might have to contact you for some stuff at some point later on. That's good work though, good job. Go check out that on, by the way. We shouted him out earlier. Nice stuff. Is it possible to animate realism color? What do you mean? Explain. I don't know what you're talking about. You're gonna have to break that down to be simpler. Explain. Animate co realism color. Animate color realistically. Yeah, of course it is. A lot of things are animated realistically. In fact, most things are. I'm doing homework at the moment, or else I would totally draw along. I can draw along after. All the um, stuff on the stream goes on YouTube, by the way, so if you ever miss a stream and you hate the way that YouTube, I'm sorry, they hate the way that Twitch VODs work, just follow my YouTube channel. It's exclamation mark YouTube, I think, is the command. I don't like put tags or anything in the videos, I'm not trying to grow it or anything, it's just, it's a repository specifically for people that follow the stream. Thanks, DT. MVP right there. Okay, do a quick timer check and we can start. Timer is operational, we are good to go. Get this nice and central, get my brushes. I'll be painting this with uh, with an oil set, which is gonna be fun. All right, so we go three, two, one, and let's go. I'll start with just blocking out the background. I want a dull warm up top, and we can use a dull green down bottom. Just some basic, basic ideas, not to spend too much time there, but just some notion of what we're going to see. I'll put one little selection line right over there. And then you would argue saying that selection line, ah, oh, it's a bit too crazy for, uh, I should not, I shouldn't hit the tab button. But selection keys can easily kill something. You can easily kill the life in a painting, but it's okay. I will control it at a later point. Uh, I don't want to go crazy with the values right now as well. So I, I'm going to just bring that value down a little bit when I just painted. It was a bit too strong, a bit too hot. We don't need even this much, to be honest. We can really rein this in. So just something for my armor to go go against. And of course, now that this line is so so strict, I'm going to just affect it ever so slightly with just a little bit of softening. And we're all good to go. Even throw in some darkness in there, uh, if I still choose to. Just something to kind of liven up the background, right? Because I don't want the background to be just completely dead. Because I'm not a fan of dead backgrounds. I love it when the background has some life to it, has some character. Um, there's nothing wrong with painting for painting against gradients, for example, but try not to paint against just just nothing. Just don't paint against just a flat a flat color because you want your piece to be appreciated in a manner that, that works, right? And it's hard to see what it, what it looks like as a as like a finished product being the artist sometimes. But really, um, it's difficult for you to really show the true colors or true values are appreciated if you have such a distracting plain background sometimes. So it's actually worth strongly thinking about don't um don't put, make your background plain just put something in there you know something is fine just a little bit of something I'm just playing around with this just having some fun but i'll jump into the piece in just a second and that's right now so let's block in some stuff 
I mean, uh, like, do animate people in realistic colors? Yeah, it happens all the time. There's so many uh, examples of that, right? I mean, look at what they do in uh, in Disney and DreamWorks and all the other projects. I mean, all their uh, all their colors are realistic, like pictures like Frozen and Tangled and all those other things. And they're all realistic colors. I mean, the choice of the color may not be realistic half the time, but certainly the interaction of color and surface is uh, very realistic. It's very very realistic. That's why it uh, doesn't appear to be strange to us. And some of the people that work on those produ uh, productions are some of the greatest uh, environment and color painters of our time, right? Like Nathan Fox, who worked on Shrek and worked on Aladdin and other projects. And he is arguably one of the best artists I've ever seen uh, for color. It's just incredible. I'm putting in some basic gestures. Do I want to get this in perfectly? Not really. I don't really care about perfect, perfect proportions, but just roughly kind of mapping things in. How far away are certain things? How close are certain things? What are the volumes of certain things? And in the middle of this, I will be always, always thinking about trying to get strong notions of negative shape to begin with. The negative shape is really what's going to save my life for a lot of these pieces. So I'd like to just put a little bit of focus on here. So I see a very clear shape right over there, so I paint a very clear shape. Simple as that. Just figure out where things are supposed to go. Put a circle in there. Get the plate in here. So just basic mapping out of the piece. Nothing too specific. I work a little bit more straight than most people. But again, how you sketch is entirely up to you. Just make sure that it is not inefficient, because you want to have Plenty of time to get a good rendering out there. And you might say, well, I, I like to take my time when I paint. And that's totally fair, and that's your prerogative. But realize that the more time you spend painting a piece, the less time you spend painting more pieces. So while I do think you should take your time with your work and never rush, uh, don't be lazy either. Don't uh, don't take excessive amounts of time. There's nobody that's benefited, uh, least of all you, by that. The more you paint, the better you will get. So whatever is conducive to painting more is something that you should always consider. If improvement is, of course, something that you are concerned about, which it should be, I guess. Just blocking in areas, thinking a lot about that negative shape. And also I'm using a lot of techniques like plumb lining, shape association. If you're curious about any of my proportional techniques, they are not anything unique to me. They are methods that I've gone over in the past, but if you want a great course on it, check out a an artist called Jonathan Hardesty, really, really good artist to learn proportion from. And again, I'm not very strict with these proportions. I don't mind if they go a little bit awry. Just getting a general read is sufficient for me at this point. I don't really care about uh, extreme, extreme drop in this piece. So I'm using a negative shape between the chin and the shoulder, I'm kind of roughly laying where I think the head should go. And I use a plumb line to where the left side of the head used to go, where the neck used to go. Next goes right over there. I'll slightly adjust some shapes right over there. And again, I'm going to put the hair in just as I would anything else. So just because it's a head doesn't mean we, we have to treat it differently. That's a big mistake that we, a lot of people make, is that uh, when you're drawing something you think is different or you're unfamiliar with, you tend to stop applying fundamentals to it. Like hair is a classic example of that. People say, okay, I have a problem drawing hair. Hair is so difficult. But really, it, it's a confusing thing because when I, when I get hair crits, and I get them a lot of times, um, the problem really isn't with the, with the hair or even with the artist, it's just with the approach to the hair. They think the hair is something different, but I always say on the stream, a thing is a thing, right? So fundamentals will apply to it, no matter what you're painting, there's going to be some amount of fundamental that applies to it. So don't, uh, don't put anything on the pedestal. If you can paint something, you can most likely paint a lot of things. Uh, you just need to figure out how to arrange stuff in your head. But it's not like a crazy difference between hair and something else. It's treated like everything else. What is the value? What is the edge? What is the shape? What is the color? What are the proportions? You get that right and everything falls into place. I don't really need all that much more. Dude, this girl has two blades. How cool is that? Hell yes. I where that ends, right about there. Oh, that foreshortening as well, my goodness. I wish I could spend more time to get that, but I'm probably not going to paint that in anything more than an abstract way. Really cool though, really, really cool get up. I want to 
You want two blades within the painting? <laughs> I got two phones. Why don't you get your hand down here? I don't think I'm going to paint them hand. This, this part over here I'm going to abstract a little bit more. Because again, that's not my area of focus. You have a giant spear and you're going to be happy with that, alright? Well, let me turn this car around. I will. The face is out of tilt, but we should be pretty good to go. Evaluate that overall silhouette. Do we want to change anything with that? I kind of want to bulk up the shoulder a bit more. And work on this angle a bit more. I want to dual wheel stylus pens. I did a left-handed stream, Jesse, not too long ago. And it was actually a lot better than I thought it would be. I think I could even I could do it. I think I could learn uh, how to uh, how to draw with my my left. Be ha haing about. <laughs> I think I can manage it. But who knows? I think I can do a lot of things. Can I do a lot of things? No. Okay. Well, that's my basic block in. It took me eight minutes to get here. I had to draw a bit with my left hand as well. I messed up my hand last year and was out of the game for a while. That sucks, but you can definitely overcome it. Uh, so many people that I've heard of. Uh, so many great artists have as well, so I don't doubt that somebody like you can as well. Everything comes from your brain, so it shouldn't be too difficult to learn. Exactly, I think it's, it's very possible. Okay, let's start to pepper some things in. Uh, I gotta attribute, or rather I gotta figure out some color ideas right now, at this stage. So, I'm gonna take these values over here, I'll take that as a really dull blue. Which I think is gonna be a good contrast with the dull greens over here. And the face is gonna be a nice, lovely warm. So, that's how we're gonna interpret the piece, because you gotta have some basis for the color, and the decisions you make. So, I'll start right over here, I'm gonna apply some strokes. What is visual intelligence? That could mean a lot of things. I guess it's subjective. And I have some context there. I'll bring this down to more of a gray. So what I'm doing heavily when I pick a color is I really try to think about reuse when I pick it. So whenever I pick something, I go immediately into thinking, okay, where can I use this? Also, right before that, I just want to apply a quick neutralizing layer underneath my armor just a quick little layer like this because i don't want that environment in the background to bleed into my armor too much uh, that's something that i d definitely do not want to happen because that is something that can easily easily happen so just to prevent bleed through we're gonna get a nice little neutral color and put it underneath everything you can think about this as almost like applying gesso um underneath your uh, your charcoal sketch if you're doing an oil painting just priming canvas because bleed through is, you know, it's definitely a problem. Okay, let's block out those darks really quickly. Get a beautiful, beautiful dark. We'll take a dark blue for that. Take a dark blue for the hair. We'll just layer that in where it needs to go. Is that dark enough? No, but I'm reserving colors. Almost like an underpainting. Just kind of figuring out where my relative values are going to go. Why is this brush so big with the shape dynamics? My goodness, it's going crazy. Okay, just nice and easy. Flipping regularly, of course. I do like to flip a lot while I work. Just a personal thing. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna choose to go nice and red for the shadows on the surface. I think that would look kind of cool. So we're gonna put these shadows in. Like I said, for metals, it is worth the idea of putting these in early. So nice and easy, we just put some ideas down here. I don't wanna be perfect with my strokes. I don't think I need to be, so I will not be. Just an idea of where these are gonna go because I'm going to be painting over that regardless, so I just need to add some amount of dark in there and I should be fine moving forward. Throw some dark in here as well. And again, like I said, reuse is the name of the game. So when you can reuse, do reuse, right? So if you have the opportunity to do, use something again, use something again. Is it possible to paint from, paint imagination without reference? Well, yeah, look at this for example, this is entirely without reference. Right? I had some notion about the faces, right? I had some notion about the design, but none of the rendering, none of the lighting, nothing ever came from any picture. Okay, so get that highlight in there really quick. Like I said, let's quickly establish the direction of light source. Right over there, right over there. So I don't mind doing this in a semi-sketchy manner. 
just want to define things early on. I don't like segmenting the painting too much. So if I see a light, we'll paint the light. We don't uh, want to go from dark to light or light to dark or any of that, that kind of stuff. It's definitely an approach to do so. But do we need to? Well, not really. I don't really paint that way. I think it's fine doing it this way as well. Mia's grab us gun. Rianne, good to see you. How's your day going? So again, that strong, that strong idea. What are we trying to do here? What are we really trying to show with this piece? We're trying to show the idea that we have this warm reflected coming from the bottom, this, this greenish warm reflected from the bottom, and we have this cool light hitting from the top. And that's basically the story of this piece, right? We have this warm contrast of the skin in the middle of that, but beyond that, it's easy, it's, it's very, very direct, and it's very possible. That's all we need to concern ourselves with. And right now, I'm just painting in the same values all over, just kind of maintaining a coordination. There will be some amount of change later on in the piece, but the most important thing, the most important to always think about when you're doing your work and you want to complete in a good amount of time is you should always be thinking about putting yourself in a position where it's easy to evaluate your artwork, which means that don't spend a billion hours trying to make everything look perfect because it's much easier to make that claim and make it so much more accurately if you kind of just make your best assumption and then just roll with it for the rest of the painting and then when it comes time to evaluate you evaluate and you say okay well, this is wrong this is right and you can do so with a lot more authority because it's difficult to say objectively what is wrong and what is right for an incomplete canvas for a canvas that is empty in certain areas because again everything on a painting is so immensely relative everything on a painting is relative Things that are warm can look cool if you change something next to them. Things that are light can look dark if you, if you change something next to them. For example, this value is light. Well, this is the value right over there. I choose a lighter value, use the same value. Now that value is dark. See? Context. Context is important. You gotta always think about it. So if you don't have the context and if you can't account for context, it can be pretty important to just, just say, you know what? Let me just wait a little bit on that. Let's just make my best guess. And your best guess could be right or wrong, right? The better you get, the better your guesses become. But it's always important, no matter who you are, to be objective about your painting. And say, you know what, I, I tried my hardest over there, but I'm not going to treat it like it's correct just because I did it. I'm going to try and evaluate it objectively. And hopefully that amounts to something accurate and uh, overall visually appealing towards the end of the piece. That's what we all got to do, all our work. Okay, so we're just reusing colors as much as we can. So I'm not gonna I'm not introducing things nearly as quickly as I usually do, and that's done entirely by choice, right? Because I can easily jump in, I can put a billion textures down, I can put a billion pieces of information down. I don't I don't see too much of a benefit from doing that at this point. We will get into it at some point, but not just yet. I'm just searching for a brush here. This is a brush that I kind of want for some texturing later on, I'm just looking for it. I'm sure I'll find it at some point. Not that I need it to be honest, because I'm working with so much texture on this piece that uh, it's fine even if I don't find particular textures because the brush texture is going to take care of a lot of things. You'll find that in a lot of like realistic paintings, very seldom do they think about adding interesting brush texture of, like outright. Most of the time it's like they just think about getting the value, the color, the proportion right. And because of the innate quality of canvas, you tend to always have uh, enough context for you to just fill in the texture in your mind. Like for, for example, if you closely examine marble, uh, in, a, in a traditional painting, uh, traditional oil painting specifically, you compare marble and you compare that to something like um, like porcelain or metal even in a lot of cases, the finish is kind of the same, but it doesn't read the same because of the context, because of how the values have been interpreted. That's an interesting little thing to think about. New Skype, how's it going, man? I don't know if I said hi to you. How's it going? We can start to expand on our value range right now. We can start to double down on certain things. So we'll double down on this darkness of the hair. I gotta put in that value for the, for the face, by the way. I'm actually missing that right now. We can put that in just a second. But again, it's just a simple question of figuring out where things go, figuring out a good home for some of these values, some of these decisions that you made, and then just bringing it home with just a bit of rendering. Should be very, very manageable. So even the hair behaves a little bit like the metal in that you have that same reflective element in the directions pointed towards my light source. But hair is a lot more matte because you don't have 
nearly as much of an effect with diffused light on it. And that same dark quality throughout the piece. There you go. Okay. So let's put that warmness in for the face really quickly. Ryan, how have the piece has been going for you? I hope you've been having fun, uh, fun with stuff. We make the face a lot more locally lighter. Something like this is fine. Um, let's add just a ton, just a little bit of a tinge of red to that. Just a bit more red. Uh, how does that look? That's all right. Not the, maybe I prefer the actual value that I put earlier. Of course, there's going to be a bunch of painting on top of this. There's no compulsion to get skin color right uh, at the very beginning. People always have this question sometimes. They'll be like, what is the color of skin? Well, there's no simple answer to that. It really depends on the environment, depends on the direction of light, depends on a lot of things. But generally, the color of skin is in this range. Right? And it can be basically anything within that range. And even out of the range, if I bring a, a blue light to the face of this girl, her face is going to be a little bit blue. If it's right next to her face, is going to be a lot blue. It's just the nature of things. All relative. There you go. Has something blocked off for the face. Okay. Let's slightly reshape existing value, and then we can move on a little bit further. Meaning that I just want to get things looking a little bit more coordinated and throw in some additional little darker values if I need to in certain areas and then I can start to restructure certain things. There's going to be a lot of incidentals on this piece, a lot of incidental values that happen because of the way that I use my strokes, the, the brush tips for example. So those I very much do welcome because again I just want a lot of surface intrigue on this painting. This, that's what I search for. Areas in the middle, those need to be somewhat accounted for, so always curious about how to get that exact texture. So I know how I would do this with my usual brush pack, but I'm using a new one, so in some cases, like, I always have to stop and think about exactly what I would do in these areas over here. Can I use that? Looks a bit too much like fur, so I don't think I can. Can I use this? Uh, perhaps. A bit too directional, I think. If that was a non-directional brush, I think it would, would have been fine. If you have Methemo goblin mania. Goblinemia, you would have blue skin normally. Is that true? If you have a Sama Lama Duma Lama. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna use a bit of paste, uh, pastel here. Use a bit of pastel on that texture right over there. We'll push it to a bit, of a, bit more of a warm though. A warm flavor right there on that transition. And of course, the main thing is we block out the areas. That's why something, a painting that's even flat, a flat painting but done accurately, is still gonna be fine. It's a blood disorder? No kidding. We'll choose a dark, um, let's say a, a dark gray color for the straps. I'll put those straps in really quickly. So strap right over there. And there's a strap right here. We can do that with two strokes. There, there. And a strap to the side. It goes a bit more warmer there, right? So we push a little bit more warm. It goes a little bit more warmer right there. Maybe even more than that. See that lovely red right there? That's a cool, cool color. I like it a lot. Is that where the myth that royals have blue blood comes from? That's actually a great question. Is that true? Jesse, you need to... Well, you need to go on Wikipedia, and then you need to cook. Not sure about that. You know, we were actually taught in school when I was younger, we were taught about um, how blood turns blue when exposed to oxygen or whatever. No, it turns red when it's exposed to oxygen. We were taught that in school. Shout out to uh, my little school in Bumfuck, India. They didn't know what they were saying. I mean, there must be an explanation, right? Yeah, sometimes these things have really weird origins, like... I mean, do you know the origin of the word cakewalk? Like, that was a cakewalk? It's got some really interesting and very racist uh, origins. Language is such an interesting thing. I'm gonna push this right over here to more of a darker purple. Because why not, right? Get some of that variation. Let's push this into a dark. The reason being is that there is a bleed through here. So rather than paint in everything as light and paint these small little marks, I'll paint everything as dark and then paint these large marks over here. I was taught that in school, but I do remember a bunch of kids saying it. Yeah, but I had a lot of things like that when I was growing up. Like um, the idea of 
a crow. This is gonna sound really stupid to a lot of you guys, but forgive me. Uh, <laughs> one of my teachers said that a crow has only one. It has two eyes, but one eyeball. That's what I, what I was told. Two eyes, but one eyeball. You figure that one out. Figure out the logistics behind that 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 great great statement right there. Shout out to my Sanskrit teacher. That tool bag. What does it even mean? Until this day, I have no idea. That fucking dude used to pinch so goddamn hard, though. Him and my local language teacher, the local language that I speak is Kannada, because I'm from South India. But uh, my goodness, was that teacher a fucking hag. Like, she just enjoyed abusing kids. That's what she, like, she enjoyed doing that. That's why she, why she signed up. I hope she's dead. I really do. Um. You got pin? Yeah, dude, like, it is ridiculous. So there's some unique kind of shapes over here. I'm gonna go against the, the grain here, and hopefully Zone Singer Sergeant, Rembrandt, and Bougaro don't come out of the grave to haunt me. But I'm gonna just throw some selection tool on this painting, just because those shapes are a bit too regular for me to want to paint regularly. So I can just do this, right? And nobody's gonna feel any way about it. Hopefully you guys don't, don't hunt me down. But I just wanna do a little bit of that really quickly, because it's just an easy way of doing that. Lots of horrible teachers. Why teach if you hate kids? I know, right? I got spotted with wooden rulers. So fun. Wooden and steel, right? Because these stainless steel, aluminum, whatever it is, like there were a bunch of rulers that came out when I was younger. And everybody's like, oh my goodness, look at this ruler. It's not made of wood. Are those artists you listed are saying selection tool? Are they really? Are you, are you a medium? Are you one of those ghost people? So we've got a lot of the flats laid in already. We got some intricacy down there, but uh, we cannot rest upon these laurels. We have to continue. We must must trudge onward. So once I get the flats, I'm actually going to cut the opacity of my pen a bit more because otherwise, some of these some of these brushes become unusable at high opacity, and I'm painting at a very high opacity right now. So some of these brushes it just don't work uh, how they intended to work. So we can do that in a second. Uh, then we just amp the read of the light real quickly. So we're gonna amp that light just a little bit. So we push it all the way down here, and we're gonna grab, gonna grab this. How's your portfolio coming up? Well, it's coming up quite well. Having a good old time with it. Submission in two weeks. Put that over there. I think I found what brush I'm going to use for the metallic texture. I'm going to just put a little bit of that on there. Slowly but surely, we will be... Home free. Making a portfolio. What kind of work are you trying to get? No work. Uh, trying to get into school, actually. It's for an entertainment design course. I'm applying to Art Center uh, in October 1st, and then I'm going to apply to Places like Feng Zhu and Nomon and Brainstorm, things like that later on. But the big deadline is Art Center, which is the 1st of October. So just for school. Throw some light down here. So I'm going to intentionally paint this with a super bright brush here because do we really need to pull any punches here? I'll put a little bit of saturation on there. So I don't want this to be a, just a valve that cuts in. We'll start right over there. And now I can paint some intricacy. I don't want to be random with this. I don't want to be random, but I also don't want to be hyper specific because I can really kill the, uh, the feel of the painting. So I'll be a combination of both if it's possible. Is it possible? I don't know. But we gotta try this. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna believe in our heart of hearts. There's a bunch of male kind of texture down there, so I'm gonna just put just a notion of it right over there. So I'm making strokes with different values. I'm not trying to just do this via combination of layers because I want I want to evoke certain things I don't want to just draw them out right just evoke their existence because a we don't have time to do it and b even if we did have time 
somewhat defeats the purpose of the study, which is again armor abstraction. It's not uh, paint this picture one is to one. You're not going to learn too much from that right now, at least. You can learn a lot from that, but from now on, for this painful. See that darkness right there? That's how you know it's metal. Because you wouldn't dare put that kind of darkness anywhere else. You would not dare. How dare you? Exactly, yes, again, we're doing a, a metal study right now. We went over some of the fundamentals of metal design and of metal painting, and now we're just applying some of those fundamentals to a larger piece. I hope you're having a good day. I'm going to throw in some beautiful softs right now. Throw in some softs on the metal surface. These softs are almost they're really, really vital to getting like a, a beautiful solid read. And I also use it as an opportunity to get some mild noting of the color. For example, I want a slight slight amount of warm over here. I can paint that slight warm. I have one slight cools in certain areas, so I can paint those slight cools. I can start to warm out or round out certain forms at this stage as well. So I can do a bit of correction. So whenever I, I need to do corrections, I always do so with a little bit of texture on there, which kind of gives me uh, more time on the piece basically because I don't have to correct it and then correct the value. I do kind of both and I get the texture for free in that process. So it's a good thing to think about. If I want to go into a place again, I want to address a certain location again, I can do so and also still maintain that notion of intrigue, which is just fun. I can also adjust this value over here, I can make it a bit more, a bit stronger. There's a lot of blue in this piece that we have not painted in. Let's just paint in a base for that blue and I'll sample from that base to coordinate. So whenever I add a new color to a piece, I kind of think about what the truest area of the color is and I put that in. And I basically whenever I have to put that color anywhere else, I try and relate it to what I just put down. So I'm just going to find my, my true blue basically, uh, which is this. And I'll just use every blue in the piece from this blue. So I'll sample here, I'll darken it maybe, and I'll bring it down here. That's basically how I want to do it, because I want my colors to coordinate. Color coordination is a big thing to make your piece look a bit more cohesive. Um, a good example of this would be James Gurney. He does this a lot in his work. James Gurney is a m -m 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 monster, an absolute monster artist. So you can consider this is a great piece of advice for two reasons. Number one being it's a great way of just saving a bunch of time because you're reusing things, especially if you're working traditionally. You only have your colors mixed up on your palette. Just reuse the color as much as you can because mixing takes time and it's less time painting, it's more time thinking, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you are on a crunch for time, it's something that you have to always think about. That's a small detail, I can do that later. But um, yeah, I mean, being able to paint something quickly, being able to produce something quickly, it is a skill that should be, should be developed, it should be thought about. All the time you should think about this skill. Very, very important skill. It grants us so many opportunities if we're able to get an idea down quickly. And the most important and the most guaranteed of them all is the fact that you can do more paintings. If you paint quickly, you can do more paintings. And that is, should not be taken for granted. That is a big, big thing. But yeah, going for a certain amount of quality is good. Going for finished pieces is also good. Do you make time for quick paintings. So I do the reverse of that, I think I do too many quick paintings. Those are too many finished pieces. But hey. But good to see you, Kazaki. How's, how's your work been? I'm gonna paint these nice, lovely solos in here. So things are coming together right now, right? We've been painting for 31 minutes. And things are coming together, nice and easy. And some nice, solid little marks right there for that sword. Same thing over here, paint that nice. I'm gonna touch it with a little bit of warm right there. Just to get just an impression of what that looks like. Get the top of the sword out of the way and also a bunch of sampling here. Sample from around that, make sure everything is integrated well into the piece. And you don't really need all that many values. You don't need all that many values to make something work. Right? It's like a, like a one server, like if you had company coming over to your apartment, for instance, and if everything was dirty, but what would you do? You wouldn't try and make everything look perfect from top to bottom because you wouldn't have the time for that. But rather than that, you would try and just do the minimum requirement, right? That utilitarian approach of getting things done. 
And for a lot of things, if you want something to look finished, just get the fundamental aspect of those things out of the way, which means that just get your fundamental painting out of the way. You don't have to do a bunch of different textures, you don't have to do a bunch of different, uh, you know, little tiny details on everything. But does it have a highlight? Put a highlight. Does it have a core shadow? Put a core shadow. Does it have, you know, some direction of light? Yes. Because the thing is, it doesn't take all that much for you to believe that something belongs to the scene. But if you miss any of the crucial characteristics of something, it becomes obvious the painting is incomplete. Right? Because the difference between something that's stylized and something that's incomplete, right? If you stylize something but you neglected to put the highlights in, people are going to be just like, oh, well, you could have had the highlights. Even somebody that doesn't know, even somebody that doesn't know painting, even they'll say, well, it looks a little bit like you could use something with that. But if you address every component, and you know, if you address it, then it's going to look fine. It's going to be fine no matter what you do. It's going to be just fine. I'm going to tone this value down. Because you see that? That value over there, it corresponds way more to these values over here. So we'll tone it down just a smidge. Just a smidge. This kind of sounds like our army motto. Faster is faster. Yeah, I think... Uh, I'm definitely in line with that. Get some of that beautiful rendering on there. There's some engraving and some mild occlusion happening in certain areas. We can address that in a second. Let's just do a little bit of spring cleaning in certain areas. Just get it uh, to about where it's going to be in the finished painting. So all I need on these areas over here, I just want the value to be a bit more uniform. I don't want that incidental shape right over there. Get that uniform value on there. Maybe just a little bit of variation because of reflection. And the thing that we need to finish that little area is just the idea of putting in a quick stroke of highlight on the corner. That's all we need. So right over there, slam that in there, and we should be done with that particular plate right there. So that's all we really need. What is this What is this brush doing? What are, what are you? Yeah, I'm going to pause the timer just really quickly because I need to do this. Because my chat is blocking my brush names, so I don't exactly know what I'm using. I haven't talked about it, but uh, it is actually um, important because I, I'm not familiar with the icons just yet. It's up. Oh, that explains why it was awful, because that's my dirty sketch brush. Who are you right here? Abs, how's it going, man? Okay, we can go back. Hit that control one real quick. Okay, so I want detail lines. That's the one that I think is a good one for this purpose. I select that local value and I just want to make it brighter. Just that much, and that's all I need. I'll throw a bit of darkness underneath here, just a bit of occlusion. Just to kind of separate these little portions of armor right over there. That should be pretty good to go. You see that reflection of the sword hilt on, right over there? So this is the sword, and what we just talked about at the beginning of the stream, fundamentals of armor. So because this is a secondary source, because it is black, we see it as black, which means a reflective surface would see it as black or see it as dark, and, and indeed it does. The armor is reflective, and it's showing us the impression of those hilts, which is awesome, man. It's, again, it's confirming our theory, it's confirming our logic. And that's so important because we need to see this work so we can put it in our own stuff. Right? That's figuring out logic right there. So I'm going to put a notion of that in there. I'm going to put a couple of dark lines. It's always going to look a little bit weird at the very beginning, but the more you either you step away from, from your work or you just add more context to it, and it's always going to fit. Because it is indeed a part of the scene. So context in this case could be I could mildly modify the edges right over there. I could make the edges a bit softer. And that'll make you think, oh, well, it must be more of a reflection. It can't be just another piece of darkness on the canvas. And so you can do things like that. It's perfectly fine. This over here is a re reflection of her arm, by the way. It's arm on her um, on her side. So like, like, just like that, you can keep justifying throughout the piece. You can justify exactly why certain values are. Which means that when you put an arm in your piece, when you put a hilt on your piece, when you do any of these things on your own work, you're able to objectively say and make decisions on why you would put certain values in, in areas, which makes your read of your armor that much stronger. So that's why we look for logic in our pieces. So it's just about collecting. I was talking to Maddie earlier about this. But it's just the idea of collecting information, collecting logic. So if you're able to logically say, well, this area is going to be this color because of this, then we're able to paint anything that we want because we said attribute logic. We set a bunch of conditions 
early in the piece we say okay this piece is going to have this premise it's going to be a girl who's going to have armor here it's going to have this over here and then we can make it all believable just by applying the logic that we've learned through our study So it's gonna go down there. I'm not gonna put that much context down uh, near the um, near the waist. I think I have plenty of context. I do want to put engraving, and I do want to add the value of the specular as well. So I want the spec to be really, really nice and bright. So let's just throw in that beautiful bright specular. This is a very, very, you know, it's a it requires a little bit of uh, not giving a shit about anything because it's a lot of value there. It's a very hefty, hefty value. So oftentimes you you can't really. Uh, be a pussy when you put these values down. You gotta really jump in and just slam them down and then hope to God that it works. And it does oftentimes. And again, it's a digital pain thing. I mean, what are we afraid of? What's gonna happen? Our computer's gonna catch on fire? Hell no, we're not traditional. <laughs> we don't have to pay the consequence of our decisions. We just get to make them freely. And that's why they hate us. They hate us because they're anus. Is that right, Just Abs? But hey, you gotta jump, you gotta put that down there. Sometimes it's way more easier to make this decision when um, when you can actually see your light source. Because then you can just say, oh, well, my light source is that value, so it's not that bright. But when you have your, your, your drawing without the light source in it, it becomes a little bit of a problem because you're like, wait a second, well, this is so much brighter than everything else on my piece. Can I really justifiably put this value down there? And you can, but it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to make the decision. It's easy when you have a reference and you have a good eye for value. But overall, when you're looking at just your piece, it can be difficult. It can be a difficult thing to say. You gotta just stick with it. It's gonna, it's gonna believe that what you're doing is right. I'm gonna throw in some darkness right over there. Look at this brush. How weird is that? That's supposed to be my, my detailed brush in the pack. I'm following the pack word for word right now, but eventually I will make modifications to suit my own interests. But yeah, it's been it's been working out pretty okay. I certainly do not mind the uh, the pack for the most part. I think a lot of uh, the in intended usages are okay. This is the digital atelier pack on Krita, so I use Krita as a free program. So anybody can download it for free to try it. I'm not sponsored by them. I would like to be though. That would be nice. But they are they're an indie company, so they don't they don't got that that crazy crazy money going on with them. Here's another good tip for metals. Uh, consistency. So when something is shaped a similar way, you can reuse a lot of the values. So this is a cylinder shaped very similar to this cylinder, shaped very similar to this cylinder. So a lot of the values are going to be repeated right over there. So you're going to see a lot of the same value across the board. So even though the value is not exactly the same as the reference, because I've chosen to, to turn that down, just because they coordinate, it's going to give me enough information about what that is, and it's going to look finished. So just because they coordinate, it's sufficient. Right over there. I do want to make some of this a little bit more cleaner than I painted it though. But some of it is looking a little bit too textury and I want areas of calm in this painting. I just want some calm areas with no texture on them. Because if everything is textured, nothing looks textured. So it's, it makes the painting so much more boring. So I need to add this little bit of a warm here. I'll do it with a flat brush. I'll do it with a flat brush, just like that. Because I don't want everything to be textured. It's going to make the entire painting just look a little bit less interesting. Because interest comes from difference and if everything is the same, then nothing is different. A little bit of that right there. We're getting a nice solid read. Again, just like in the lights, do not do not hesitate in the darkness. Make sure that we are having very, very strong statements in that darkness. We want to paint that directly like that. And areas like this, we can simply abstract upon. We can just make the dark areas dark. We can make the reflected area over there. I actually don't have the value that needs to go here, uh, but I can, I can just get a facsimile of it. So I took this value over here, over there, off the belt to get the initial dark, so, so the dark is coordinated in the piece. I'll grab a light value from, let's say, over here on the disk. Put a light value right over there. So again, we're just abstracting this, this region over here, we're not going to be painting it directly. I'll add a bit of context on there. 
a little bit of this and throw maybe a couple of highlights on there as well but again the focus is not here so my strokes are going to be very very limited i'll throw in a darker greener value on here just to finish and i'll throw in just a, just a little bit of a line to contain it that's all we need to do in that, that location we don't need to add any more any more context things we could add could be like a seam in the middle right over there but again we don't need to paint that directly that's fine uh, there is another circle over here the great thing about that is i already have a circle in my piece i have a disc in my piece so i can just take the values from that will it be the same no but it will be somewhat corresponding it will correspond about to be about the same so that helps me a lot with my, with my decision making look at the darkness that needs to go over here i grab that push it in there's some lovely little lines there that come out of there i kind of like that a lot it's um Paint those with this brush here. That brush is great for like little details because it looks very, uh, very incidental. I kind of like the sketchy feel of it. Neat. Okay, so again, we gotta paint the disc. So I grab that warmness. The warmness is already there on the top. I'll shift it to a bit more of a red, just like that, and I get that same quality. Of light going on the bottom and I get the effect of the disc and I just paint in that highlight to finish there you go I've got a disc right there maybe a little bit of occlusion towards the bottom would be nice and if you want to show your uh, your education there you can throw a little bit of spec on there a bit of specular but it holds it holds just fine there's a nice connected shadow shapes down here, and I encourage myself to connect those. Another shadow shapes are one of those really, really strong painting things that you have to think about when doing any kind of work, because this makes things look more painterly, which is what a lot of people search for in paintings. They want things to look more painterly, and a connected shadow shape is one of those big painterly things you can put in a painting, because it's a big simplification, and simplification is the foundation of a lot of good painting. So you're trying to convey an idea in less important and it is always good to see it's just a good appealing thing to see because you have such a clarity in the idea and that just makes for good painting a lot of good paintings are very clear in what they are it is realistic realism paintings paintings in the style of realism you see how that highlight right there really begins to finish out that particular point like i said all you need to do for a lot of these kind of things a lot of these to make it look somewhat finished or at least once once over it's just the idea of adding those fundamentals to it just add those fundamental ideas to it so does it have a highlight does it have a shadow does it have a core shadow does it have a, no, all these different regions and if that's done most of the time the painting is going to look somewhat finished like the hair doesn't look finished because it lacks highlights on it and it lacks that response to the highlights so you can just put some highlights on there and the hair is going to look finished so we're not stuck here guessing like we know exactly what we need to do Put to pink there, throw it like this. What is a light source color? Like a DSAT, what is it? DSAT blue, fine, so I'm gonna have to be a bit more matte. And hair is not gonna have as much reflectedness. Something like this is fine. I'll just throw a little bit of that on there. And we can finish the hair. I can do that, let's do this realistically. I'm sorry, we'll do this in the style of, uh, of realistic artists, which means this highlight actually becomes smoother. And they paint this with, uh, with smooth strokes so you can smooth the highlight in. Remember, the hallmark is it goes light to dark. Erica, good to see you. It goes light to dark to light to dark. I think over here, we have this beautiful dark base. And we bring in a lovely light on top of it. The entire top, the lighter value, the front dips forward, which is why it gets a bit of a darker value. And just address the shape of the hair really quick. Good 
Good to see you, Erica. How's it going? There needs to be a darker volume really quickly, right over there. Get the dark reflection of the handle, and you can also use this to fix the waist, because the waist needs to be a little bit more straight than that. So we fixed it by using the same value on the side. Easy enough. Right. We have a lovely brown gold for the belt buckle. And I'm going to put the belt buckle in here. I think it's a fairly important thing. Uh, we we'll just use this brush for it. I don't want it to be like a point of interest, so I'm not going to be painting this with a very distinct value, but some amount of visual breakup along with the shadow is enough. Going pretty good. Your advice yesterday was really helpful. Thank you. I'm glad that it was. It's totally the point. I'm glad that it helps. It's good to know because if people just uh, say they just take it and don't apply it, then I have no idea if what I said made any sense or not. I do want to help. But thanks. I appreciate that. I hope the piece is going well. Just like a, a facsimile of the of the belt, right? I didn't draw the belt directly, but I put some of the components of it on there. I put the car shadow, I put the local color somewhat, I put a bit of a reflection right now. And that's sometimes enough, especially if it's not the area of interest. Like, this is really the strokes that I made. It doesn't look like anything, per se. But it's enough for the read. Good. Makes sense? Good. I need a dark down here. It's an occlusion. Well, it's more of a car shadow, I guess, but... Still counts as an occlusion between the belt and the body right there. So I'm gonna put a little bit of that on there. So what, we're 48 minutes into the piece and we got almost a full set of armor. Fairly well rendered. I do want to actually spend some time on the face, so maybe we'll extend the time a little bit. But the armor is well on its way to be completed. There's some embroidery that I want to kind of do as well on it. I think that would be cool. Let's put these little details with a softer brush, just to emphasize the, the reflections. I think that uh, that needs to be kind of clear, it needs to be visually clear what's a reflection, what's not a reflection. It's a little bit, you know, so I'm, I'm going to amp that effect a little bit more in certain regions. You see that? You see that little darkness over here? Because this is a, sp a spherical shape on the breast, even that's reflecting the sword right there. How cool is that? It's reflecting the same sword. And now I know what values to put down there. It's going to reflect the sword's color down here. And it's going to reflect the sword's highlight up there, which I haven't put in just yet. But how neat is that, man? It just shows you just how much you can put on the piece. And how far the logic can be extended. Because you can know something, but you, can, you don't truly know something unless you figure out how it um, really works in reality. So, really cool. Really, really cool stuff. Like, we need to understand how we can push things and just how far things can be pushed. And look, look at how crazy the effects are of these, um, these components in the painting. Like, would you ever think, think about that? Because I would not. I, will, I have no shame in admitting I would not think about that. I would not think about the sword hitting the spherical breaststroke like that. I would just not think about it. So that's a really neat thing for me. So hopefully, now in the future, I will think about it. Because I need to. I want to do armor and I want to do it beautifully. So put this in there. Like I said, this is a reflection, so I'm going to slightly soften it up just for the sake of visual clarity. And for the elements over here as well. So there's some darkness right over there. I'm going to choose the same darkness as the right-hand side. For the sake of completion. There's a plate over there. I don't know what value needs to go there, but the value does correspond to a lot of the values on my chest. So I'll pick the chest value and I'll put it down there immediately and now I have a good basis to work from. It has a highlight, I'll pick the chest highlight value, I'll put it there as well, easy enough. Right? And again, there's a dark value reflected and that's probably still the sword right there. So is that the sword? I don't know. But it's similar to the sword value. So again, so I haven't touched my color palette at all during any of that. What I did touch heavily was my painting. The painting must coordinate with itself. Garmin Boy, thanks for the follow, man. I do appreciate that. So we get that same specular effect. Like I said, for it to look complete, we don't need all that much. We just need to give all the effects of the light, all the effects of the environment, and give some notion towards the local color, and that's going to be enough. So get that cast shadow in, get those reflectors in, you know, get the effect of light in, and it should look done. It should look like you've, you know, you've done your due diligence there. You've done your work there. 
but it's going to be somewhat complete. Okay. So we can actually spend some time on the face. Uh, we can add some extra time to the timer. But the armor looks beautiful. Like, it already looks fantastic. I'm a big fan of it. So, like I said, why does this line look incomplete? Why does that not look like it's a proper guard, right? It's a proper cross guard. Because one, the shape doesn't match the perspective. So we fix that. So we go one, one stroke, two stroke right there. And again, the outline, the shape of this, it's not just a flat plane. It has thickness to it. And the thickness is going to be in shadow. So we just apply that darkness with a suitable brush, like this maybe. And that's all we need, really need to do. So even if this was a flat guard, like that, I could just do that and that would be sufficient. Like I would just put a little bit of highlight on there and it would look fine. Right? So I could just do this much. And it suddenly it belongs to the scene because it's once over. So what is that? Three strokes? It doesn't cost us all that much time. And it, it does matter. It does matter that I did that. Because the more incomplete things are, that are on your piece, the, the piece itself is going to suffer from it, right? Even though it's, it's not an area that is an area of importance because it's weighed down here on the piece, it's still going to stick out like a sore thumb. Like I said at the beginning of this piece, when people put in just flat backgrounds, it is a thing that affects your piece negatively because of how beautiful your piece is and how complex your piece is compared to something that's so non-complex, it's going to have a very marked effect because the mind's going to be distracted by the plain background. So put something in there. So don't be uninteresting to the point of being interesting. Just put something in there. Put a, put a gradient in there. That's enough. And nine times out of ten, it's going to make it better. And this is for illustration. If it's a character art piece with character design page, or if it's an orthographic, yes, 100% don't put in anything else but the character because it's for design. But if it's not for design, if it's for try and show a good illustration, then you have no business. You have no business not letting your design shine in the way that it needs to. I'm having a lot of fun with this, by the way. How long do we take for the face? Do we take like 15? We'll add a 15 to the timer and we'll, we'll paint that face in. It might be fun. I want these darks over here to be really, really responsible. I want them to... Because these are some key darks in my painting, and I don't want them to be ambiguous. I really want these darks to have a lot of structure and thought behind them. So I'm going to spend some time to just go over these once more. And I just want them to show... Just tell me a bit more. I don't want them to be like nothing. Because this area is an area of high interest, right? Right now in my painting, that's the most interesting area right over there. And then right over here, second. So I don't want to just do nothing here. Like, I don't want to just appear like I just, you know, just slopped a bunch of things together. I really want this to look like some thought went into the development of this area. Because it's one of those key areas already. Sure, you can make something look like the area of focus, but your area of focus can look terrible, right? Because I decided to do a bunch of things together over here, and it looked like area of focus because it's the most active region of my, on my canvas. That doesn't mean it looks good, right? We haven't arrived at that stage just yet. We have no idea. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So something uh, that's it's concerning. So just affecting a little bit on that, that area, just uh, doing some due diligence in there, getting some information in there. It's important. So we did it, and now it looks a little bit better. I like this bumpy texture on the armor. Not something that I've ever had to paint uh, in the past, but it's uh, it's been interesting trying to emulate that with the tools that I have right now. Because I'm not using my usual tool set. I know how I would do that. How I would do that regularly, I would use a, a canvas texture brush. But um, it's been interesting trying to do that in this in this brush pack. It's been really cool. Of course, throw some speculars on there. That might be fun. And how does this resolve? This resolves with a bit of dark red as it turns. So I'll just put a little bit of that on there, and I'll, I'll resolve that uh, that plate really quickly so it looks finished. Let's resolve this little edge over here as well. It goes a bit towards the pink, a bit towards the light, and we put in that highlight value. Uh, a bit stronger than that. I like that a lot. Okay, cool. And I'll resolve it uh, in this area over here because it's a bit more ambiguous. Is this brush sufficient for this? I want something a little bit more sharper than that. How about this? That's sharp. There we go. That's what I want. I feel like the more I press with this brush, the less I actually get from it. There we go. Got it. Uh, yeah, we can leave it in there. Just a little bit more than that. There you go. That's better. Cool. So, there are some occlusions that we're missing. We can paint those occlusions in really quickly. Occlusion down there. 
Illusions, if you guys are wondering, are areas where light is prevented from traveling. Occluding. Hiding, I think, is what that means. But I'm happy with that so far. I think a good one is to one. It's not even a one is to one, it's an abstraction, so even better. A lot of complexity in the armor as well. Not an easy thing to do. I'll be excited if any anybody uh, did this painting along with me. I do encourage people to paint along, by the way, and we can review right after. I'm going to throw a little bit of texture on the top right there. I don't want to make it more complex, but again, whenever you make the kind of change, you want to always settle down and make sure that the end of it is nice and rigid. That a, the, rigidity is what, the rigidity is what's going to make it look like metal. Right over there, that's fine. Okay, I think we're in good shape right now. Let's try and tackle a little bit of that embossing that's happening on the surface. So what really makes it look like it's been embossed? So I have a solution for this, which is using um, the layer transparency. So this is one solution. We can get it by getting a darker texture. Let's say like a really dark texture like this, for example. And we'll just trace the um, the formation of those beautiful surface textures. So something like this, maybe. Here's one idea that I have right now. So I could do it this way. Just apply that texture like that. And I could cut the opacity, maybe. And that gives me something of a notion of it. And I can go on another layer on top of that. I can reinforce what I just painted by throwing in a highlight layer or throwing in some highlights on top of it. So like this. Not with that brush, but with this brush. So this is one of the ideas that I had. So you can kind of give a little bit of a facsimile of that happening. I don't think I like this solution though. It looks a little bit too uh, a little bit too weak to me. Like it works. I think it works. Like if I get the opacity a bit, bit more down, it's totally possible that this could be a, a solution. Maybe I'll leave it here for the time being. But there are definitely other ones. If anybody has suggestions on that, I'm all ears. I can also just paint to account for it. I can also abstract over it and give context in certain areas. There are a few solutions. But for now, I'm just gonna paint that slight amount of occlusion right over there. That runs across the surface. Tinges towards red, so I will tinge it towards red. Give a mild hint of that. Goes around right over there. A bit of detail. Throw a bit of highlight in the center. Do that with a bit more of a solid brush, I think. There we go. That's one hour. That's our armor done. Pretty goddamn solid, man. I'm okay with that. It's a decent armor rendering. Nice. Shall we do the face, or do we go on? I don't, well, I don't want to do another study, because uh, I want to work on the other piece today. So maybe we could just spend an additional half an hour, get that face looking nice and pretty, and then have something to post for that Instagram. Let's pause the timer, take a drink of water, and then we'll continue. See this, by the way, that's why we uh, applied that gesso layer 
I applied this layer to prevent it from having too much bleed through, because bleed through is always a problem, as you see here. So it's worth it. Alright. I had a sneeze there, sorry. <laughs> Let's play around with this face. So have you done an analysis of Lop's work? Yes, indeed. That is in the previous um, stream at the very beginning. There's a detailed breakdown. Uh, you can go, if you want to go to the world, you can. It's also on my YouTube channel, so you can check that out as well. YouTube is just a fancy way of storing my wads, but I have a good breakup of it. And I'm working on a lob style piece right now, so I'm about, uh, I'd say about three hours into this piece. This piece was a lot larger, so we started out over here, but I switched from um, this scene to this scene, because I wanted to have a bit more character focus, but uh, it's getting there. A lot of theories, a lot of tests, but uh, yeah, we're figuring it out. Having a ton of fun with it. Yeah, you can definitely uh, check out that that video if you're curious about my thoughts. But yeah, there's uh, some some good information in there. Some stuff I've yet to confirm. Let's fix the cropping a little bit. Um, let me just leave it like this. I don't know how much Instagram's going to crop. There we go. All right. Well, let's do the face. That'll be fun. We'll map out the features and everything. It's going to be fun. Mama Fox, it's so good to see you. Shy was in here yesterday. It was so good to. Uh, Catch you on as well. Maddie, how's it going? We uh, did an armor study in an hour just now, so this is one hour of work. And um, yeah, I'm thinking about uh, doing the face on this character as well. He's got a beautiful face, and uh, I think it would be good just, to, just for the sake of completion, you know? Just paint the entire thing. Be kind of fun. Generally speaking, I like to develop the face. I wasn't planning on putting the face in here for this character, but um, I, I do dig the way the armor has turned out. I think uh, it's a successful piece. So let's put that face on there, and uh, we'll do it for the sake of completion. Why isn't Twitch telling people when I sub to them? <laughs> Did you sub? Well, thank you, Maddie. Uh, you're gonna have to refresh your page, and it'll give you a dialogue option. It'll give you a dialogue option saying, "Hey, this is your uh, this is your anniversary, so uh, you know you can announce it now." That's how it generally works. Thank you, Mama Fox. Very kind of you. But yeah, we've been having a good time with this. Just cutting a few of the lines out there, because again, on a painting, you got to be a little bit, a little bit careful uh, about excessively lining things. Because the more lines you put on things, the less painterly it's going to feel. It's going to be a lot more outlined, and you got to be a bit, uh, a bit concerned about that. You've mastered metal. I wouldn't say mastered. I do. I know a lot of metal fundamental, um, fundamental, and I went over that at the beginning of the stream. Uh, but there is a lot that I am not completely certain about. So I've gone from like making things look fundamentally like metals to how do metals get detailed? Uh, what are the ways that metals get detailed? There's so much information about that. It's insane. So really trying to figure out what those things are, how to apply them and what the, uh, the manner is behind applying them. I hate painting metals. Give me fur of a metal. Fur is also, it's also great. Uh, and fur I think would be a little bit easier as well. But as long as you understand the logic of metals, it should be perfectly fine. And if you want, after the stream, I'll upload this VOD. But at the beginning, I go very, fairly in depth into just what you need to be able to uh, to paint metals. And it's not really that hard. Uh, it's quite, it's quite straightforward. Ultimate Goku, holy shit! He's here. <laughs> Thanks for the for the compliment, man. This is about an hour of work. That's well, exactly an hour of work, actually. It's uh, one hour and forty-seven seconds of work. But this is my armor study uh, done. Uh, usually I just abandon it here, because if you guys want to see some more work, here are some examples of what I just did. So, a 60 minute study for armor, stuff like this, so I don't usually put faces in there. Uh, this is a two and a half hour piece, uh, not really a study. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking about doing it, because I, I like the way this is drawn. I think uh, I, I wouldn't mind. I'm interested. Fungal Wood, good to see you. It is going well, thank you for asking. Hopefully you are okay as well today. And uh, yeah, if anybody's an artist, drop some work in the uh, in the chat. I do like looking at uh, looking at people. 
looking at people, <laughs> looking at people's work. I find four more difficult than metal. Metal is actually one of the easier materials to paint. Add contrast, boom, looks like metal. It's not just contrast though. It's not just contrast, it's a bit more specific in there because you need to be able to justify the contrast. Because they can easily, easily be, um, I can give a lot of cases where there would be no contrast on a metallic surface. Right. I like I like having the logic behind there. I'm good, thanks. I'm uh, Ozzy. Lost my password. and couldn't get the get into the email. Ozzy, you, your darling being good to see you. Have you ever thought of doing some of these pieces traditionally? I could. I actually have uh, done armor traditionally, but I don't really have an interest in it right now because I don't have the time and it's not going to really benefit. Because I'm learning fundamentals. I'm going to learn fundamentals. I always like doing it uh, digitally because it's just way way faster to iterate. Like just in this piece, I tested like four or five theories on what could work, what couldn't work. And I was able to like do it on the same piece. But if this was traditional, I would need five pieces of paper and about four, four or five times the time. So I do like learning a lot on, uh, on digital. I think it's a great way of applying information just because of how easy it is to iterate. Now, I know that's going to be met with some amount of controversy because again, they're going to be traditional theorists in the stream. Uh, but again, it's just an opinion. You don't have to, you don't have to take my word for it. I'm not an artist, I just pass those genes in the next generation. Uh, to be fair, I don't think any of us are really, uh, are really air quotes. Like, either, either all of us are artists or no, none of us are artists, I think. Right? I mean, which one of us are, you know, are making stuff for movies and, and games and TV shows and whatnot? I think we're all creative. Right? I think we can all make pieces. We're all capable. And definitely, Shai is very, very capable. So, as you know that um, yeah, you got those genes in you. If you wish to apply them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Just a it's just a question to me of, uh, of starting. But yeah, I mean, I learned to paint uh, metals from oil painters, so... All of these should be applicable. Uh, if that was like the uh, innuendo in the question. All of these uh, should are definitely 100% applicable um, traditionally. Because I paint in a single layer. I don't use blending modes. I don't use modification tools. None of that happens here, so... Because I could, I could really amp the space, by the way. We could go full Ross draws, right? We could go full Ross draws and do something like this. We go ba bam Hell yeah, got that metal in there. Got that color dodge. But uh, I don't, I don't want to. I like the charm of the piece. Okay, let's do this face, yeah? It's not a, a face study, it was an armor study, but let's put, let's put the face in here for the purpose of completion. Because why not? Okay, I need to drink some water. My favorite is when people say oh, I'm blessed with artistic talent like yeah I'm blessed it has nothing to do with all the work I put in see I don't like I don't like that interpretation of it right I don't like when people say you're given talent but when people say you're talented I've learned to not get like put off by that because they're just saying you're skilled and they think it's uh no just the same the same word it's uh paraphrasing But yeah, ultimately, if anybody says that you have a God-given talent, I mean, it shows way more about them than it does about, uh, does about you. Because I, I don't need validation from anybody, right? I don't need anybody to tell me that my work is good or my work is bad. If you have advice to give me, I'll take it. But, like, there's nothing anybody that, that, that can really say that'll prevent me from painting tomorrow or the day after or the day after that. <laughs> Every artist loves exposure, yeah. Man, I'm gonna pimp you out, man. I got 15 users on my SoundCloud and they're gonna love your work. In a study, is it legal to use blend modes? Of course it is, 100%. Especially if you're trying to learn how to use those modes to achieve a particular kind of look, 100%. There's nothing wrong with that. Right now, I'm trying to do this with the... Um, with a bit of an emulation towards uh, traditional technique of oils, so I'm not using it just because I don't think it's necessary. Um, because I don't want effects that kind of look excessively digital. So, in the context of my current study, um, no. And also in my painting in general, I don't try to use uh, way, too, way too much of that. Like, it was a, it's been a really interesting experience doing this one because I had to start this painting from grayscale. And I just never do that. I always paint in color. I don't like grayscale painting. I mean, I do a bunch of painting in grayscale strictly, um, but I do not um, like transferring a piece from gray to color. I think that's just a shitty thing. <laughs> I don't like it. So 
So this painting was uh, in grey originally. And then we turn it into this. And I got no uh, no uh, problems with people going from grayscale to color, by the way. It's just that I don't like doing it. That personal preference. How is the color wheel there in camera's only mode? This is a, a trick generic. It's a trick in OBS. It's a it's a window capture right there. This is where it actually is. Over there, see? I tricked you. Beastie does that? He does, and I think it's fine. I, I'm glad he's uh, choosing value, but there's a lot I could say to help him out um, on the transition because it's really not... Color is not so simple as applying a hue to a value. It's way more than that. Uh, and he'll realize this as well as he becomes better. I'm not gonna go in there and say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. That's what assholes do. And Beastie's um, leveling up every day. Oh, I needed, I needed when full screened, I was tricked. If you need it while full screened, there is a slight way of getting around that. So this is my tab mode on, uh, on Krita. So you can set it so that your tab mode doesn't get rid of dockers. So you can tab along with dockers as well, because uh, I think it's somewhere in here, actually. It might be like views or whatever. It's somewhere in here. I changed this a while ago. It might be in, in Krita settings. He has, he has definitely leveled up. A oh, man right there. Buying lunch with exposure tickets is so nice, I know. It's the best. But yeah, there is a way of configuring it. Uh, let me just see if I can find that out for you really quickly. Um... Hmm. I'll spend just a little bit of time on this. I think I just I stumbled into it the other day. I don't seem to find it right now. Okay, I think a quick Google search will help you. Sorry about that. I, I don't tend to uh, really commit software things to memory, uh, which is which sucks. I should be able to tell you exactly where that is from. Most likely, it's somewhere in um, in configure toolbars. Most likely. But yeah, there's a lot more to... So this is the argument against transitioning from grayscale to color all the time, because because when you transition from grayscale to color, your color are, uh, colors are not going to respect your shapes oftentimes, and that makes no sense whatsoever in painting. So that's why gradient mapping is way better than using overlays. Um, and level shifting, for example, is also okay. And color balancing is also okay, but just applying overlay uh, with flat color is a mistake, and it ruins paintings. Uh, Marco Booth used a great video on this, by the way. But it can be done, and done successfully. Does Beastie have an Instagram? Oh, of course he does. He's my, my teammate. I'll link it for you. Yeah, but that's the biggest argument against it. It's just you gotta maintain your shapes, because shapes of value, what make paintings, and Shapes of value, depending on the value that they have, will have different colors associated with them. So, not respecting that makes your color scheme homogenous, which can kill the uh, the color interest in a painting. Which is, it's a very, very valid concern. It's something that I struggle with a lot. In my studies, I tried to avoid blend modes because I thought it was like cheating. There's nothing called cheating. There really isn't anything like that. Um, so what cheating is, is a deviation from the rules, like an illegal deviation in the rule set. But uh, what are the rules for painting? Who says that, like, who said that using a blend mode is illegitimate? Ultimately, if you're not infringing on people's, create, uh, people's own creations, you're not hurting anybody, whatever you need to do to get to an end result is something that you probably should do to get to an end result. And if you haven't done it, you should do it to learn it, right? You can choose preference later on, but you should be, you should learn how to do it from whatever like mode or whatever way that you want. Like I've painted, like I was just talking about uh, changing things from grayscale to color and how I don't like it. But here I am, I'm studying it, right? Here I am studying how to do that. It's really important to understand how to arrive at a conclusion. It's very, very important. The same way that I don't have anything against color picking. I don't have anything against tracing. Um, I don't have anything against like straight up copying if you need to. But all depends on the intent that you're doing it for. Are you doing it to learn? 
Are you doing it to improve? Are you doing it to explore alternative possibilities? Understand mechanics behind it? All these things can justify any of those other things, right? I am going to take this painting further, Jesse. I'm just having a bit of a talk. But we're going to start in just a couple of seconds here. Uh, we're just answering some questions. Um, but yeah, this painting I'm going to take, also this, this flop painting I'm going to take to, uh, to finish, actually. Uh, I'm going to get it to the uh, same level of finish, hopefully. We'll see. But, um... But yeah, we'll, uh... What, was it, what were we talking about just now? Talking about cheating, right? So, yeah, there is no such thing. There really is no such thing. Like, my entire design portfolio is... So much of it is from bashing, so much of it is from a bunch of overpainting, a bunch of sampling, but that's just how the, that's how to be a professional is to be efficient is to use the most effective techniques right this idea that the value of a painting lies in the legitimacy so-called of the practices involved in making that painting is absolutely bullshit anybody that says that it's a gatekeeper or a purist or, or a mindless purist i should say it's dumb right you use whatever you can like even back back in the heyday when there were no computers People were using camera obscura to get good proportions, right? They were using methods to, to basically trace from uh, from life. Whatever whatever gets you there, you know, it's it's all legitimate. There's no such thing as a as a cheat. All entirely depends on what the intention is, what the time constraint is, what the expectation is. Those are those are just those are the questions you need to ask yourself. Otherwise, nothing is really a cheat. Unless it's again, it's hurting anybody, it's infringing on something. Other, other than that, it doesn't really matter. And honestly, if you're a professional and you know you're not like you don't know how to bash and you want to be a professional, that's a fucking joke. Uh, if you don't know how to use blending modes, if you don't know how to convert from gray to, to color, good luck getting a job. Mama Fox says, I think if you have an innate ability, be it art, sports, music, it initially comes easy. For oneself, the greater the likelihood of pursuing it to a higher level. To become great at any of those requires hours of practice, studying, research to reach one's highest potential and mastery. Not everyone has the initial ability. Yeah, so it might give you a head start, for example, but most of the time when somebody's an expert at something, it's because they've been doing it for a long time. That's that's all it is. You don't have to use those things, you can paint everything from scratch. But that being said, there is nothing wrong using all the tricks you can. Yeah, you can paint everything from scratch, right? But the question is like, should you? And is it an efficient way of doing things? Is it a way that, again, is consistent with your requirements, right? Always go from a requirement-oriented standpoint. And then cheating becomes a subjective thing, right? I'm going to use my nuts. <laughs> I'm going to use your nuts to paint. Might take you a while. All right, let's do this face. Shall we use the dreaded... Look, I don't even like painting on, on different layers. What is this? <laughs> That's a good one. That reminds me of um, of Go Bargo, aka Kyle Camo. Disgusting. <laughs> That's a gun chin. Good to see you, buddy. Let's paint this face. All right. So we'll paint this. We'll paint this in like a Rembrandt style. Not Rembrandt. Sorry, like a Bouguereau style. So we'll do it using this kind of blocking technique. So we painted majority shapes using similar value, and then we fill. We fill it in. We fill called. Uh, well, that's how I'll approach this one because I've been really obsessed with that style of, of work of workflow. I've been really liking it. Okay, so we'll restart the timer in three, two, one, and we go. We'll cap it at one thirty, let's say. Okay, first thing that we do is we've got to map out the features. So let's grab a rough brush and ask ourselves some really important questions. The main one being: Is the overall silhouette of the face? decent enough for us to continue painting. Now, I have to work from the bottom to the top because I cannot adjust the bottom chin over here. The chin is somewhat decently situated. So if I had to change this chin, I had to change this armor, which means I had to change the chest. All of this has been developed already, so I can't change it. So I need to make, make my changes vertical. The entire face is a tad too short. I'm sorry, a tad too long. That's the opposite of short. I'm gonna bring it down a little bit more. I'm looking for that outside silhouette. That's all I care about. So once I get that outside silhouette, I can continue. This looks a bit closer. Again, make evaluation. The top of it tapers in a bit more, so we taper it in a bit more. Just really simple changes, but really important changes because if this angle is incorrect, 
that means that everything I measure against an angle becomes incorrect. And it is, it's, a, it's a house of cards on shaky foundations. Okay, make any further things that I need to change. I can add a slight little divot even at this stage to indicate the brow region right over there. I'm gonna go grab some lunch, I'll be back soon. If I'm not back before you end, I hope. Yeah, I, you, I'll be back. I, I'll be there when you when you come back, don't worry about it. I'll be back, <laughs> fucking Terminator. But yeah, have a good meal. Anything else that I want to fix at this point? I always make a mistake, and you will too. Mark my words if you're new to art, because I am. You will make this mistake, you will make the chin far, far, far too straight. Make it tapered, tapers down into that jaw. And this is sufficient for me to start. Looks human enough, there are some exaggerations, but it is okay. Right, and then we put in our majorities. I'll be back. <laughs> Since you're trying to get into art school, are you trying to make art your job someday? Yes. And which part are you more interested in? Concept work or illustration work? Concept work. I don't mind getting hired as an illustrator, but I'm going to school for concept. I'm going to, I'm going to go to school for entertainment design. Because I don't, uh, I don't really mind my illustration skill. I do mind my concept skill. I think that, that's something I can really learn a lot from. I think illustration is something I can study by my own. And I'm not going to study both at school. So we're going to paint the majority shape really quickly. I can map out features before I do that. So let's just do that. Let's just do it nice and easy like. So we'll put a line in there for the brow really, really quickly. So a nice easy line for the brow. Just going to get that uh, the impression of it fairly down. How about that? That's decent enough. And let's section out the face. Figure out that Loomis, that Loomis X formed by the intersection of the axis line, which is that, and the brow line. So. Essentially, figure out where the face is pointed. So this line needs to go through the middle of the nose. So we'll just roughly put it in right over there. Do I know for certain? No. But do I put it in strongly? Yes. I see a whale. Of course, if you guys are, are new to the stream, you don't know what the whale is. And I feel bad for you because the whale is going to save your life. That whale is the, the unsung hero of the stream. Which is why I have an emote for it. Specific, that's my whale emote. I'm just going to fill in these majority shapes. So why not? We can fill them in. This is going to be uh, monochromatic, so we have no issue at this stage. And it's going to help me a lot with my verification as well. Put it in that way. Okay, so we just take the distance that we just painted in. At this stage, I want to slightly flatten up the shape over here. Make it more consistent, right? And we bring this shadow of the nose down. So this distance is going to be equivalent to this distance over here from the bottom of the brow to the bottom of the nose. It's gonna be somewhat consistent right over there. And I can verify this by simply putting the shape in a bit more strongly and looking at the negative shape formed by the form shadow on the cheek along with the cast shadow of the brow. So that it forms a shape in there. So I just put that in. I can get that fairly consistently. There we go. So again, just with the same value everywhere. I'm not trying to be hyper specific, but just enough for me to get a good, good strong read. On the painting. So I'm just doing this with one single value with, with uh, however many you'd like. But I do think they should keep it a bit a bit under control. This area is majority, majority in the darkness. So I'll just I'll just do it like this really quickly. Get that majority darkness in there and I get this lovely little form shadow on the cheek and towards the chin. At this stage, I can also bring in the contour of the head. I might indeed have to increase the overall size of the face at the end of this, very, very possible, because the way I'm cutting in, I'm not cutting in equally in all in all angles, so while the shape might be good, it might be decent, uh, it's very likely that the overall face might become too small towards the end of this, so I can easily correct for that. Do I have any measure as to how large the face needs to be? Well, the face 100% needs to be larger than this little disc over here. That disc needs to be about the size of the chin up to the eyebrow, so chin up to eyebrow. Right now it's consistent, so I should be aiming to keep it relatively in this region. Uh, and that should uh, allow me to keep the painting consistent with the rest of the image. And it could even stand to be a bit higher, I would think, on the face, it could be a little bit more higher. Uh, and we can address that. Uh, as we come to it, it should be fine. Okay, so put in some little marks over here. We'll add in some information about the eyes, about the nose, about those primary features. The first thing that I'll do for this is I'll get in. I'll cut in onto that shadow of the socket right there. I'll cut in, get the first eye. And the same thing over there, look at the distance between the two eyes. So I'll just mark an area which indicates 
the side of this eye really quickly. So it's about roughly there. I have the second eye right over there. I just indicate it again with some amount of roughness. But I cut it into this larger shape. So the larger shape kind of guides where this goes. So it's easy to kind of put that large shape in and then put the smaller shape after that. Much more consistent that way. So I'm not trying to look for exact proportion of the eye just yet. But just, just a facsimile of it is sufficient for me right now. Just an idea of where it's going to go. And just keeping the angle somewhat consistent. I don't want to double and triple down just yet. Keep things nice and vague. For the time being, nice and vague, but the vague things are accurate. Let's put the nostril in there, as well as some information to the bottom of the nose. This brush goes excessively dark. I need to fix the color dynamics on this brush because it goes really dark for a not dark value. Because I don't really need this to be done dark uh, to get a good read, I, but it just goes dark by itself. Okay. So for the lips, always a little bit of a difficult thing to place, but it is, of course, placeable. So again, the lip, the line of the lips will follow the line of the eyes. So the eyes, we put that in decently, and the eyes should be somewhat coordinated like that, for example. That, then we should have the line for the lips most of the time because that's all on a solid plane. We can't really manipulate the upper jaw all that much. We push out a little bit, I guess. But again, it's part of the solid skull structure, so it's gonna be consistent with the eyes uh, the majority of the time. Of course, the edges may not be because of the smiles, but the overall gesture of it should be around the same gesture as the eyes, and indeed, you put it in just like that. And there's gonna be a form shadow underneath the bottom lip. I don't like ever drawing the bottom lip outright. I prefer to just uh, in put information about the top lip there and be happy with that. So we can just lay it in like that. Draw a plumb line to figure out exactly where the side of the lips are. So plumb line makes it a little bit longer than it is. I'm not going for a one is to one, but just something coordinated with the reference is fine by me. I'm okay with it as long as it's coordinated. Get the bottom of the lip and then we just put in that shadow really quickly. And now that I have some large shapes, I can make some adjustments. But yeah, I definitely would not mind um, getting hired as an illustrator. I love illustrations, but uh, well, I love illustrating, but definitely would like to uh, keep my options open and have the skill set to concept as well. Like I said, I think uh, it's something that I could easily... It seems like it's a little bit... Of a, like a hubris laid statement saying that I could learn by myself, but I really think I could. I was looking at really good concept artists um, currently in the industry. Like take MDJ for example, Modern Day James. Like I feel like my my quick draw is about as good as his for a lot of studies, for a lot of for a lot of reference based painting. I think I'm just about as fast as he is with similar or appreciable amounts of quality. So, and he's such a better designer than me. He's so fucking good at design. I don't think I'm that far off. Stonefly has a gun. Don't you say it. Don't you say it. Okay. Add the features out. Who are you talking about? Modern Day James. He's a great, um, great designer. It's this dude. Thanks, Jump. Okay, I'm gonna slightly shift some of these features a little bit higher. A little bit higher. Oh. Because I just want a bit more real estate in the neck region. It's free real estate. How's it going, Stonefly? How's the work been? Uh, I don't know if I like that change. Let me just move it a little bit more back. That's better. Because something in the way that it sits on the head, it's kind of bothersome. Just doing something like this will fix it though. We're fine. Okay, again, mapping on the features. Almost done with that. We have most of the, we have the majority in here. Uh, we can just fix the shapes now, and it will be free to proceed. I'm going well. I'm still watching while I work. Ooh, nasty. You don't get caught.
Let's make some equations here. On the shape, but this is a really cool way of doing it. That's cool. Uh, I'm not actually in school right now. I'm on a two. Well, I'm on a two month sabbatical from um, my master's program, and I'm just using the time to work on my portfolio and applying to art school in the, in the in the meantime. If I get into art school, then that's going to be a career shift. I'll just transfer out. The point when I get jealous on digital painters. Wait, what are you jealous of, Rianne? Kyle has a gun. I painted this armor in an hour. It's a one hour study. I thought you were talking about a backpack a few streams ago. A backpack? I don't quite know what you mean. But yeah, that was our, uh, our armor study, Kyle. I'm just finishing up this, um, this face really quickly. I just want something more finished. Okay, at this stage, I got the majority of my proportions marked out. And I gotta make some quick corrections onto the contours because now that I have information set on, I can make changes. What industry are you in now? I am in the engineering industry. I do, well, I've, I've uh, worked as and I study, I have studied for and have degrees in uh, electrical and electronic engineering. I worked as a software, software designer and technician for about a year. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in it. Oh, right, right, Rianne. I got you. Holy smoke, smart guy. Uh, not, not that smart, because <laughs> I'm shifting careers. Not the smartest thing in the world, but it's what I gotta do, you know? No, it's gotta it's got do it. I've mapped out all the features, and uh, right now it's just a question of applying adequate amounts of, uh, of paint. So this is uh, my breakdown, same kind of method as I did for this one. So we arrived at this stage over here where I've painted out a lot of the shapes. Why am I doing this? It's because I want to quickly be able to make manipulations in the overall and the overall proportions. And I don't want to be painting everything and then finding unfortunate things about my painting that I haven't found out earlier. It's going to be a really cool way of just mapping out all the features in monotone, basically, and then painting over because it doesn't cost us anything to paint over. Because we can paint it very effectively, especially because we're doing this in digital. So it's going to be a really fun way of just kind of mapping on everything. So you don't have any unfortunate surprises later on. I know I was in your stream, but someone else was chatting about it. Really? Well, I'm not quite sure about that. Hopefully I, I figure it out. Hopefully my brain stops, you know, stops doing nothing and figures out what you're talking about. Well, how's it going, Kyle? Follow Kyle, by the way. Big shout out to my man right there. Kyle Camu. I knew him when he was Go Borgo. I miss Go Borgo. He's always nicer to me than Kyle was. But it's alright, I'll forgive you, Kyle. Alright, so make some slight adjustments over there. Get the hair in there. Try doing that with wood burning? No, Brian, no, I don't hate myself. I don't want to do wood burning. I got mad respect for you, but uh, that's not for me. I don't like tools that are unwieldy, you know? I got a, I got such a hatred towards unwieldy tools. And I know it's, it's not unwieldy for you, but like, it's gonna take some time for me to like get over it, which I'm just not looking forward to. But yeah, Rian does great work as well. Go follow her. She does wood burning on stream. I think it's very impressive. It's like when people come here that, that do watercolor, like abs, for example, and he says, hey, Indy, you should do you should do watercolor work. I'm like, hell no, are you kidding me? I'm not, I, don't, I don't hate myself. Why would I subject myself to that when I'm having such a fun time painting digitally? What's my benefit? Okay, well, I mapped out everything. Thanks for the shout out. I mapped out everything on the face, and I, I kind of like the way the face is. I think it's structured fairly well. I think it's going to work. So let's just make it work then. And watercolor, speaking of watercolor, dude, Lee, great job on the uh, on the Maddie prompt. I loved your work there, really good stuff. I did this armor study, and this is a one hour armor study. And I'm just putting a face on here, as you do. But welcome, man, go follow Lee, excellent artist. Okay, so now just a simple matter, just a simple calculus right now. We're gonna go boom, bam, and then biff, and then boff, and then we're done. All right, so. Light in this case is going to be desaturated and going to my armor, it's desaturated cool. 
So we could desac cool it, or we could just cheat and say desac warm, because I don't like putting desac cool in faces. Oh, uh, we can go somewhere down there. That's okay. That's okay. Or something like that should be okay. Uh, a little bit too strong there, governor. Maybe calm down a little bit more. Let's just move it here. Let's move it that way. That's fine. And I can work with that. So get those areas of highlight out there. Get those zygmatics out there. Get that brow out there. Just push our light value in certain areas. I don't want this to look hyper finished. I just want to get enough information down there. Try shifting ahead wood burning. I can't even use an eraser. It's what you gotta do, Rihanna, right? You gotta get a really strong pair of scissors and a lot of tape. And you should be able to manage it. I'm just gonna warm up some of the shadows really quickly. I don't quite know how effective this method is for time. I'm not very used to following this process. Like, I did it very, very slowly for the Bulgaro study, and it was fun. Uh, but in terms of like effective practice, so I'm going to have to skip, skip over a few steps, so rather than build up the color, I'm going to be painting true color way earlier than that. There's going to be slight little caveats, but it should still be possible. Just get those values where they need to go, be ensure that I have the appropriate amounts of values selected, and then it's all a question of just using good brushes and putting a bit of finish on there. Thankfully, a lot of the finish is taken care of because there's so much te texture that's being used in these brushes. A lot of the finish is being taken care of, like when I put this highlight in for the nose, just because of the way this brush looks, it's easier, easier to put that in there. Is there a reason you paint armor so often? Uh, yeah, because my, my portfolio is full of characters with armor in them. Uh, let's, so here's, here are my characters for my, well I don't have most of them in here, but even like the characters with a lot of cloth elements, even they have armor on them. Like this, this character is completely full of armor, so it, it helps. And also it's just a fun thing to paint. It's a very interesting thing for me to paint. I, uh, I have a lot of fun doing it. Can I just paint? I, I had my bird phase, all right, Kyle? I had my bird phase. You know, you're in the bird phase right now. But I've already had mine. I think James like the medieval timers. I do like them. My favorite part of a girl is their ankles, obviously. Oh, a little bit of highlight on there. A little bit on that D side there, Governor. Let's um, slightly affect that in a positive way. I'm going to do one thing, and one thing only. I will cut the opacity on my brush a little bit because it's a bit harsh right now, which benefits the way that I painted the armor, and I think it was a very good thing. But right now, I want to slightly affect the opacity because it's a bit too harsh for some of the transitions that I'm trying to do. So we'll just cut that a little bit. Looks pretty tough. Yeah, it's been it's gone from that tough phase to just being enjoyable right now. I just have a lot, a lot of fun painting armor. And I want to jump towards that beautiful motley green as I go lower on the face because again, even though this isn't armor and I don't have to care all that much about the secondary light sources in the, in the piece, I'm gonna amp the effect of them in this piece because again, it's a painting, so. It's up to us to really interpret things in a manner that looks visually appealing. That's our job. So I will indeed do that. For certain transitions over here, I will add an, array, an idea of softness in there with this beautiful wet brush that's in the pack. I love that, this brush over here. Really, really good. It's a fun thing to work with. This whole set of Krita is just really, really fun. And I want to slightly shift some of these colors to it's a little bit more of a red. I want to throw a little bit more red on there. And now I can actually make subtle shifts on the skin tone because the brush opacity is cut in. I love painting rusty and dark metal even more than reflective chrome metal, like so much fun. Yes, indeed, the opportunities for color, they're pretty, they're pretty awesome. Definitely a fan of that. Is uh, Maddie doing another study, Lee? Is she done streaming today? It's good to see her again. Always a fan. If you guys don't know Maddie, by the way, go check her out. My stream at a much higher level. I don't want to just soft blend everything on this face. That's a huge mistake. It's a big beginner mistake. We gotta always include areas of hardness in a painting because otherwise, if everything is hard, nothing is hard. Everything is soft. Nothing is soft. I do want to have interesting edge variation on my work. So we'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Get in there. Rust is fun though. I should paint more rust stuff. Rather, I'm gonna burn my friend. <laughs> Feels bad, man. 
Let's throw in a beautiful lush color of the lips and into the eyes. What happens when you don't put any skill? Yeah, you gotta you gotta practice making lobsters and uh, and frying chicken on campfires in a row. A lot of the cooking XP. Or you can do that quest in Lumbridge Castle as well. That beautiful, beautiful lip in there. Right now we don't have to pull any punches with saturation because again, time's running out. So let's go dark. Not too saturated, but dark is important. Okay, that look beautiful, beautiful lips in there. Again, angle is a little bit uncoordinated, but it's fine. I'm just gonna work on fundamental there. So we need one last element to make the lip work. Well, two elements. One is we need an occlusion in the corner of the lip, and two, we need a slight amount of softness near that occlusion to make it fit because the corners of the lips, even though they're dark, they are, they are quite hard on the inside corner, but the outside of lips usually goes quite soft. So softening that up is actually a good idea. And it should always be considered. Thing to do. Soften up the corners of a lip. It goes a long way, man. Okay, so I started with the base right over there. I push it to be lighter, pinker. I'll just adjust this value. The bottom lip. So again, I'm going heavily for an evocation of it. I'm, not, I'm going for a one is to one. So again, that's why I'm painting it from so far away. I don't want anything except for that gross amount of detail. And again, this bottom, this bottom plane is sticking outward, which means this is a time for me to add two things, either red or a combination of red and reddish yellow, because that's your skin color darkened along with some reflectors from the ground. So we talked a lot about those ground reflections in the uh, armor. Not so much of importance on the skin, but still does play a role, does always have a role. Because something is matte doesn't mean it's completely matte, it's going to have a role regardless. Put like a little bit of that light around the corner of the chin right there. And then it's just a question of playing with that shape making sure it's appropriately structured it should be good to go all right let's quickly add some values that we're missing so the brow needs to show that it's actually going against the light we'll darken that up and we'll throw in maybe a bit of saturated let's say we'll keep it a bit more towards those greens right there just to be a bit more coordinated with the piece in general we'll darken that up pretty quickly just like that and maybe a bit too much saturation there we'll turn it down with that And we can bring it back in on those inside curves because it's usually nice and red. There we go. We're going to have some very sharp lines in the middle of this. So not just in the filtering, but the nostril is going to be a dark, dark value right there. Because again, value and edges are quite heavily related. So when you have a dark middle of a light, in the middle of something that's relatively lighter, you can expect that to be quite a hard edge. And indeed it is. I like to paint these occlusions in with a dark red because context is person. The so dark red seems to make some sense. And be a little bit cognizant about placement. Don't look cr cr crazy with the placement. Just something, something that makes a lot of sense with that. So one so you know. Should do us fine. Okay, so let's just paint a couple more of these Piece of information right over there. A nice soft shadow near the lip. That's the outline of the orbicularis oris muscle right there. That's the muscle around the mouth. Helps with opening the mouth right there. You have a similar muscle on your. So this, this almost reminds you of an eyelid, this like front facing maw shape. That's also because you have a similar muscle that opens up your eye. It's called the uh, orbicularis oculi. So, there you go. Now, now you too can be no fun at parties. I'm going to move this up slightly. I don't want it to be smirking. I want to move the lips up a little bit more. Okay, that's better. I've been a little bit too lax, and this is what tends to happen when I shift the opacity a bit too early is that I don't make changes that are very strong. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I will shift back 
to my usual opacity because my changes are not strong enough. I just wanted to shift it up to make some slight little changes to where's the temperature because everything was looking a little bit too dead. Right now it looks fine in terms of temperature. Well, it's not fine, but it looks better. So right now I can shift back and paint with a little bit more hardness just so I can make some changes that are a bit more effectual on the canvas. Now I can do a lot of simplification on here. So I have already a lot of information on my on my piece. It's just a question of rearranging it in a manner that makes some amount of sense. Make a gross read for the value. We could easily go a little bit lighter in a lot of regions. And as I go lighter, I also want to bring hints of red into the face as well. So we'll bring this lighter. We'll bring a hint of red. Same thing over here. Make it lighter with a hint of red. Just kind of lightening up the skin a bit more because I started from a very gray base. So a little bit concerned about Things looking a little bit too dead on the canvas. No, you don't want that. I'm simplifying a lot of these shapes, but it's fine. We should, it should be able to be held. Hold the form just fine. Again, around the contour of the eye to indicate that the cheek itself curves. We need to add a small little shape down there. This. And thankfully, we have this lovely darkness around the contour of the face, which gives us so many opportunities for correction. I love it when the hair is like this, when it's around the face, because you can make you can mess up quite severely, quite badly, and you can still kind of get away with it because you always have this darkness there to save you. Today, always good. So I'm gonna bring this hair back in just a little bit. So we'll bring this hair back in. I can do that in a kind of painterly way by doing this, so I have that softness around there. Alternatively, um, this is not an unknown thing. Uh, it's not an un unreasonable thing to put in a small amount of. Almost like a glow around the piece. So I see this in a lot of um, Bougaro pieces, for example. I see a very decent glow around it, and he kind of uses that to fix some of his outside proportions. Also possible. So I'll do something like this for the time being. Again, just to kind of get the read where I want it to be. So I'm just looking at that raw shape of the hair. And I bring this up here. Again, looking at the raw shape. When I say looking at raw shape, I mean, don't think about it as anything except for a shape. Just look at things objectively. When you go too specific and think about things as they are, it can sometimes be difficult to make like these really good claims about what they should look like. And so you draw things the way that you think they look like, as opposed to the way they are. So always something to be a bit concerned about. There is a slight amount of a taper at that point, and I can paint this back in a little bit of that imperfection. Back of the head right there. Cool. I need to soften up the sides of the face really quickly. And throw in a bunch of beautiful saturation in there as well. Something down here as well. And I don't want to have that transition on the chin. I don't want that to be so dead. I don't want that transition to be a little bit more alive. So we can adjust that by just adding an additional shape in the painting, which is just the shape of the cast shadow of the chin onto the neck and I can use that to fix my proportion as well. So I have a value down here already. It doesn't seem as sufficient as I wanted to. So I'll update the value slightly like that. And I can use the same value to start to address my issues at the bottom of the face. So I can use that to do So I'm just using the value to fix the bottom of that, uh, the chin right there. And now I can amp it and paint it with a bit of hardness. And I get that light contact occlusion. In this case, that's not really what it is, though. It's Emily, so that's what I'm reminded of. But the underside goes darker. A bit of information about where, where that happens. Maybe a bit too dead of a color. Maybe I'll shift that to more of a red. I can do this with two brushes. I can do it with this brush as well. Might be a bit softer, is what I'm looking for. So hard, but not as hard. And I think that's better. Just to indicate where that uh, the bottom of the chin is. That's a good bit of problem solving right there. I'm going to throw a bit of descent on here. Just because I don't think my face has enough gray in it. And I do like to throw a little bit of gray on there. If it makes sense to. Fix some of the shapes. The nostril doesn't go dark immediately. The bottom of the nostril is a thing. The bottom of the uh, the side of the nose is a thing, so it goes dark and then goes really dark. 
Just making a slight adjustment of that shape. You don't really see it because I painted it vaguely, but it's there. It has to be there, otherwise it makes no sense. Paint some brighter values near the lip to make the lighting consistent. I have a hard brush right over there. Paint in some lighter values right there. As well as a highlight on the lip. Okay, the bottom of the nose is generally soft. So I'll put in that soft shadow going into filtrum. And I can even throw in the highlight on the ball of the nose. Okay, side of the ball goes into highlight. Highlight on the bridge of the nose. Let's push that to a bit more red. Bomb shadow around the nose, which is similar value but goes mild saturation into the red. Similar value like that. Lovely. A bit too pink for the current palette, to be honest, because I don't see that pink anywhere else. I'm meant with two options either use the same pink and use it somewhere else. It's the option I'm going to choose, or use a different value from around the piece. A couple of options. I'll choose the first one. And to double up the side of the nose here, I'm not going to outline it, I'm just going to arrange the values on the far side to hint at it. And of course I have this lighter value that's going to go right over there to indicate the other nostril that's currently not visible. And that's how we double up that, that nose, make it look nice and strong. The value of the glabella, a bit too harsh and a bit too dead, so increase the value, increase the redness. And I can even alternatively just grab a value that's close by. That has the characteristic that I want, and just use that. The value over there was a little bit too... wasn't exactly as dark as I wanted it to be. It's a bit more darker. Or redder. That's efficient, so we have our glabella issue kind of solved. And also throw in just a little bit more brushwork to prevent some of the transitions from looking a little bit too perfect, a bit too smooth. Sometimes it usually gets incorporated already in the layers when you're layering things in, but I have not layered things in, so... Some things I gotta actively think about putting in. Uh, I believe the brush for this that I'm looking for is this brush. And I can choose to put in some deep reds over here as well. It's really deep in like the color of the piece. Some deeper values right over there near the uh, the nose. My slight amount of highlight across the lips. And of course we need to double down on the occlusion side of the lip. Double down, so a little bit deeper than that. Of course, I'm going to keep that nice and deep red. Unfortunately, I don't have access to my dodge tools, so my color palette only does so much. But uh, if I was painting this with my usual palette, I would dodge this color in, because I can't paint some saturations, because I'm limited by my software just a little bit. Well, it's not a limitation, I'm self-limiting myself. A bit of that form shadow, and again, amp up the quality with just a bit of hardness. So this goes more into the red, more to the darkness. That's how I kind of get my little occlusion lines. The little lines of the uh, outside, so the smile, the smiling muscle right there, the auras. Right over there, and add that much needed hardness that the face needs. This does need a lot of hardness. There we go, just making an assessment on whether or not. This is impacting the overall finish of the piece, and it seems to be somewhat well integrated. Just always have to just, I need to do that more. Uh, right now it's not a problem, but uh, it is definitely a problem, generally speaking. If this face is hyper-rendered, if it's under-rendered, I want to make sure that it's consistent with the rest of the piece, otherwise it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. I certainly do not want that. I'm going to restructure some of these highlights here, just to make the nose look a little bit more sensible. And here I am. How's it going, Angie? It's good to see you, man. Great post on Instagram. Yeah, we're just finishing up this um, this face right there. We did an armor study in an R, and I'm just spending some time on the face. 
It's gonna get up to snuff. So this was uh, after an hour of work. Right there. And I'm just putting that face in. How's it going, man? How have your streams been? Follow Ungeist. Or Ungeist. It's, un it's Ungeist. One of those three. Yokes. Let's put those eyes in. Been uh, been very remiss in my duties. Like how I did the texture detail on the armor. Very clever. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really fun little problem solving piece. I had a lot of enjoyment doing it. Putting those hard little lines there. Get things down. No problem, man. You deserve it. It's just a little bit harder than that face can go a long way. The chin as well protruding outward which means i need to add some notion of a form shadow right there just to give it some dimension and also the chin has a bottom to it so some darkness in there i'll just grab the darkness from the bottom of the mouth because this will invariably be coordinated gives me that bottom right there and i can cut the entire face out using the blue from the background and i get that chin really easily so again everything's justified everything's working out uh, I can push this back. It doesn't really matter that this is a pointless change because it doesn't really affect my painting all that much because the shape looks fine as is. I could make that change. I would like not to because, uh, again, I don't care about hyper accuracy. Uh, just enough that it reads the way it does. I will fix the counter on the side of the face, though. So I want that to be somewhat consistent so it doesn't go outward nearly as much. But how's it going, Ungeese? What are you working on right now? Just bringing it in a bit more. So I'm maintaining the hardness of that little uh, transition there quite intentionally. I want that to be nice and hard. Okay. A little bit of a highlight around Karunkel right there. Looking at my last of my Spotify playlist covers. Hell yeah. Awesome. And of course the brow, top of the brow does get a bit of light as well. Some people make this mistake of like thinking that everything below the eyebrow is the brow, is the underbrow and everything above is the brow, but uh, it's not true. The eyebrow can be placed a little bit differently and also depends on the expression, so not entirely true. It's not a bad rule of thumb though. Just figuring out a brush that I could use for this. Uh, something like this would be sufficient. Spotify playlist covers. Are those for commissions or are they just out of your own personal interest? I'm gonna grab something to just make the hair a bit more coordinated. I don't know if she's wearing I don't think she's wearing a wig, I think that's just her natural color. And make sure the eyebrows aren't exaggerated. Keep them nice and flat. The way that we see them. Thanks for the read yesterday. Sorry I wasn't there. Don't worry about it. I knew I knew you weren't uh, set up. I just wanted to give you some support. Because I was in your uh, your stream when you started. It's all good, don't worry. There are just for personal interest. I don't feel confident enough to take commissions. Well, I don't know about that. If people are willing to pay you, that's all you need, right? I don't want the hairline to be super clean. Pretty big thing. Uh, I've been drawing a lot of realistic paintings. Don't make the hairline, even if you see it super clean. Don't paint it super clean, because it can really take you out of a piece sometimes. So I'm going to make an active effort to mess up the hairline just a little bit. Not crazy amounts, but just some imperfection in the hairline. It can lend a lot to the piece, just to make sure things don't look hyper-perfect. And also get that little lightness in the brow back. I think I'm still at a, a big, pretty beginner level. Yeah, but then I, I, know, I know beginners that get commissions as well. It's this thing, be open to the idea. If people think that you're good enough, that's all you need. How's your food, Narcissus? I'm going to throw some highlights in there. I'm going to do so quite roughly. Yeah, but definitely be open to it. Mm, what do I use for this? How about this? Oh, Jesus Christ, you're a bit, that's way too hot right there. That's better. I haven't eaten yet. Shameful. There's some light on here. But yeah, I was in your, uh, your stream for the majority of it. I saw you working on that parrot. 
What's the idea behind the pirate uh, cow? Why are you, uh, why are you spending that much time on that? Is that like a commission or something? The um, the pad with all those perfectly like beautifully sectioned colors. It's a cool piece. I dig it. Look at overall uh, contour of the face. We need to make a big adjustment here. Ba bam right there. That's helped us a lot. And we can make another one down here as well. We can do a bit of ba bam right here. That helps us with the side contour. And make sure this is not too hard. Again, not the area of focus. I cannot draw attention right over there. Make that a bit more ambiguous. Do you have a bunch of classes again this evening? No, sir, me. I'm assuming no. Oh, there you go. Never asked me about my class classes, Kyle. The fuck? But you were different, man. All right. I like a mission just messing around. Cool. Let me know if you find anything interesting. I'm always, always curious about people's takes on things. I know that you're on that study grind just like me. Undoubtedly, you will explore things that I have not. It saved me a bunch of time. What classes do you people go to? That's another question. Indian Abroad's classes? There you go. Indian Abroad Academy right there. No, I'm not in school uh, right now. No, I'm not. That's correct. Shall we put those eyes in? Put those eyes in. Get nice and deep red, I think. Is anyone else's stream frozen? I do not know. I don't think so. Frames don't, don't seem to have dropped. Thank goodness, by the way, we can actually stream back home. It would be awful if we could not. I would certainly feel pretty bad about it. Because I would have to abandon all you guys, but it's turned out to be kind of okay. Kind of manageable. It's been nice. It's got another internet here. Is, uh, it's not the best in the world. Yeah, try refreshing, Chimp. Sorry about that, buddy. Image froze for me, but the audio kept playing. I press refresh, now it's okay. Let me check my frames. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I've actually dropped a lot of frames. But it's uh, it's okay. It should be stable right now. Sorry about that, guys. Maybe my dad going heavy on the Netflix right there. No freezing here? Good. I must say that I, I do miss uh, the Netherlands internet because my goodness was that ridiculously fast. The infrastructure of that country is pretty goddamn good. Let's not make sure, let's make sure that these are like lines, I'm sorry, these are like shapes, not lines. These look like lines too much. I'm gonna kill some of my read. That is a chill with a Netflix binge. Mm, it's just true. If you had only three hours a day, where would you put practice in? Painting and such studies seems like it's a lot, uh, a lot more time consuming. I would uh, definitely not do full pieces. I would do probably 45s. I would do um, three 45 minute studies, at least. I think that's sufficient to, uh, to learn something every single day, putting that much time in. And as far as what I would learn, it would depend on what I am currently struggling with or what I think I, I, I need, need to put time into. And if, it's, if I was a complete beginner, I would start with learning either gesture or construction. That's probably where I would start. But if you want to do it the way that I did, because that's like that's how it would, would be ideal to start with. Um, but if you want to do it the way that I did it, I learned um, 
my serious studying started with my realism course. So I studied it based on the fundamentals of realism. So it went from your idea of proportion, value, and then shape, edges, and then finally color. That's generally how I segmented my studies in. So I did uh, 150 hours worth of proportion. I did uh, a similar amount, if not a little bit more, for value. And I did half that time for edges. Um, and I was doing shapes throughout. And I spent every second until now uh, for color. So that's basically the just about the last nine months in a nutshell. So I'm, I'm still on that grind. So I'm, I'm doing color right now. So that's why I have such a big color focus, like a big explanation I had at the beginning of the stream. The reason it's come so easy to me right now is because I'm really, really thinking about it in everything that I do. So I'm not really looking for like these crazy new techniques for proportion or whatever. I am open to it, but when I do my studies, I'm really strongly thinking about, okay, how do I manage my color? And of course, on the side, I am studying design. So design is a really big thing and not something you need to study for a beginner, but eventually I feel like everybody needs to study design. You know, those inescapable things that are going to make the difference between being uh, forever a slave to references and being a good artist. Thanks, Byron. Uh, do you have any pieces? Yeah, sure. I can pop some in. Uh, let me show you. Here are some pieces when I was learning. I thought I had some saturation in my face. But uh, here are some pieces from value studies. Like, uh, Jesus, I used to paint with such a large canvas. Right there. Yeah, there are a few of them. I'm just going to cherry pick them though. Get that one right there. <laughs> Here's an armor study that I took. Uh, I spent four or five hours. I spent maybe four or five hours in the space, and this is less than an hour 48, which is really funny. And this wasn't even on stream. We've come some way, I think, for, uh, for women in armor. <laughs> it's kind of cool. I wish Photoshop was this fast, working with multiple canvases. Yeah, but then none of these are, uh, are manipulable. I can't manipulate any of these except for size and shape. So um, yeah, that's the, the trade-off. Girls with horses? I don't think I've ever drawn girls with horses before, uh, before I got on the stream. Here's my first round of color studies though. Our, our work with color. So when I first started learning about color. God, I, I improved so much uh, when I first started learning about color because my goodness was I bad at it. Because I had never worked, uh, I never understood anything about color theory before I started uh, these paintings over here. Some of them went a bit excessive, but for the most part. Granted, this is not the kind of work that I do these days, by the way, because each one of these pieces is about uh, four to five hours. So my work is much, much shorter for time span. Uh, currently, but I, I didn't always work with such a heavy time constraint. It's, you know, it's a beginner. And also, I didn't really respect it as much as I do now. Now I really respect it. There's some old school women in here. They're a bit quicker, I think. No, this, this one is a lot less quicker than. There's some older work. work for color. There's some gaps in my files here. 
Because I don't have my like my Genji piece and stuff like that. That I really liked. I like this piece a lot. I learned so much from this piece about uh, plot texture and shape. A really important piece in my, my history. Yeah, that's Kitty Akali. There's some 45 minute value pieces. I love my value pieces. They're so helpful. I was very, very abstract in this, this stage of my painting as well. Really experimenting with those brush textures. Just kind of finding, uh, finding myself, I guess. Look cool that is. Some of these are really cool. Because I was really pushing abstraction at this stage. Really pushing what it meant to like, what's fundamental to a painting. There's no features almost uh, at all on that face. A bit of airbrush in there as well. Nice. Get that glow in there. More color. A lot of these are uh, warm-ups with Bonnie as well. Me and Bonnie used to paint a lot together on her stream. And sometimes I didn't get it... Uh, no, I was tired and I couldn't get it right, so I just did it again. Here's an example of that. At the same time, but it's way better. Elk. Some uh, animal combinations, I guess. What that is. You guys played Detroit Become, Become Human? I did this one for... Uh, for Citri, do you guys know Citri draws? She was, uh, she just had joined Twitch and she, it's an inter interesting story behind this piece. So she had jo joined Twitch and she was big on DeviantArt. And at the time she had this art trade with somebody. Fuck. I can't believe you've done this. And um, the other person never delivered. So I got, I felt really bad because she's such a sweet girl. So I drew, I drew what she expected from the other person. So she wanted um, Kara from Detroit Become Human. So I gave her that piece. It was fun. And she's such a good artist, man. And she's doing well on Twitch, so God bless her. So thanks for following, man. Kyle, cheers, man. Have a good stream. I drew, uh, this is Bailey. This is a friend's dog. This is gorgeous. Yeah, I... You need to put work in. I mean, you need to have a lot of work. Like, a lot of these pieces didn't take me all that long. Some of them, a lot of my old stuff took me way longer. So eight, uh, like four or five hours. But right now, most of my work is done within an hour. So I'm able to do even more right now. But occasionally I will sit down and I will spend time on a piece. Like this is uh, seven hours of work, I think. Six or seven hours of work. Like Portrait of James. Arguably one of my favorite paintings. Uh, not, it's, it's Citri. You misspelled it. There you go. Thanks. So there's some longer pieces in here that I interspersed, but uh, even some traditional work in here. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine me doing traditional. And we got some uh, some streamers. I think at this point, I think most of you guys found my channel, so a lot of the work is recognizable. Like that's my my Kuko portrait. I got some of my favorite pieces, like my armor pieces. This, I think this is my single favorite piece of artwork I've ever done. So four and a half study on armor. The lady that's in the piece, by the way, she's a sweetheart. It's a wielder of steel on Instagram. That's me paint. Good, because I love her work. And this is basically where I started like making a name for myself, I guess, on Twitch. I started painting a lot of streamers. That's something pretty. This is... Bonnie. We saw James earlier. Um, there are some unfinished ones in here as well, if you want to see them. You want to see what abandoned pieces look like. This is an abandoned piece of Sarah Jean, because she looked way too hellish. I didn't like it. Mama Fox was in here earlier. Here's my painting of her daughter. It's a shy fox. You know, stuff like that. There's a, a lot of that kind of work in here now. Here's another abandoned painting. This is Pan. 
but abandoned pan. This was a painting that really taught me that you gotta be a little bit careful about selection tool because it can completely fuck you up. So at this point I started uh, being a little bit more careful about how I use selection tool. Because I used a ton of selection on this one and uh, it, it really ruined my life. Uh, here's some here's a better one. This is the one that I eventually ended up giving her. A way better portrait. This just a solid portrait overall. Uh, I think it was five hours of work, I think, five or six. My portrait of Ashley. So I'm a portrait artist, generally speaking, because I, I have more experience in portraiture than anything else. So portrait right there of Ashley. You guys probably know Maddie. WC Lee Art was in here earlier. He mods for Maddie. Of course, you got Mia. All of these are on my Instagram, by the way, if you want to go like them. How about a self-portrait? Nah, not interested. Doesn't really strike me, because I, I gotta be a little bit interested in when I work, so I'm just not interested in Nagi. These were uh, quite successful. I did this right after my proportional... No, right after my value studies, that's when I did this. I, I had spent a lot of time working on a bunch of uh, streamer portraits. There are way too many girls in here, so we'll bring some, some dudes. Got my boy, Wild Boy Tom. Oh, Tom G right there. There's not a lot of uh, free streamers. A lot of fun. These were are some of my most successful streams as well. And if I wanted to keep having like a crazy view count, I would keep doing streams like that, but uh, it's not. It, it wasn't benefiting me anymore uh, doing the portraits. I wanted to do better studies than that. So I think from here I went into edge studies, I think. But yeah, I mean, that's just the. Sometimes you're gonna have to make some, some kind of sacrifice like that, right? But uh, even though it might affect one aspect of your life negatively, you gotta do what's you know, really important. So I don't really mind, I don't care about Twitch viewership. Uh, I care really about learning. I, I know this for a fact because I used to do a lot of studies. Uh, I, like, I used to do a lot of paintings for people on the stream uh, as like sub incentives and stuff like that. There's a reason I have no incentives on my stream because I cannot afford to spend time on stuff that like is not actively trying to make me better. Uh, I, you know, that might make me sound like a little bit of an asshole, but the, the way that I kind of give back to the stream is I give back with information. I don't just sit here and say nothing while I paint. Like I really try and and teach and disseminate information. But beyond that, I can't, like I just don't have the time to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to give you a sub badge. I'm going to give you a, well, sub badges is fine, but like give everybody like their handcrafted letter or prints or stuff like that. It's just not, it's not me. I have a very hard time, uh, Pushing myself to do that because I just have no time in the day uh, as it is. So I would much rather just spend the time on uh, actively improving myself. And that's just how I, I lay it out for myself. So, yeah, I mean, if you're ever wondering why there's no like big incentive on my stream, like, oh, you sub and you get all of this, that's kind of why, you know, I just, uh, I think that if you, if you find the stream interesting and if you think that you found information helpful in the stream, you can sub, you can donate, you can do all that stuff. But I'm not going to actively uh, encourage it, and I'm not going to spend time in my day to make sure that you know I get that. It's fine. I'm okay financially. I'm okay. Well, I'm not okay financially after art school, but the, the point is the point. You get, you get the point I'm trying to make, right? Like you can only do so much. And it really um, affected me having to do those streams, spending like four or five hours on things that actively weren't improving, like uh, weren't helping me improve. It really. Uh, badly affects my mental state uh, and a lot of people that are, like know me well that know me really well off stream will tell you this is that i get really really pissed off and it's in a really bad mental place if i'm not actively uh, improving it's an obsession more than anything else and i'm not saying it's a good thing uh, but at least i understand it right and uh yeah i have to be careful about this kind of thing a lot of times because you, you see on stream i'm very um i have a lot of equanimity in the sense that i, I don't react to anything basically and the reason is because at the end of the day, I'm streaming for my own improvement. But the second that's taken away from me, I will turn sour so quickly. Because this is basically all that I have, I guess. My sense of self-worth comes from all of this. So it's a very difficult way. Parent, thanks for the stuff. <laughs> but my sense of self, self-worth self comes from uh, comes from painting. It comes from self-improvement, right? Um, so it's really important to me that it actually happens. That I actually get something. Because if the second that if my stream actively become something that doesn't allow me to improve 
that's the day I stopped streaming, like instantly, right? So it's just, it's just a matter of like, how do you, like, how do you, how well do you know yourself? How well do you understand what's important to you? And it's really important that I improve for the aforementioned reasons. How do you feel when you work in engineering? Not like this, I can tell you that much. Engineering is a safe option, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't the right option. Eve, how's it going? Good to see you, Eve. Been loving your post on the Instagram. We're just finishing up this painting. I did an armor study in about an hour, and now I'm just casually painting this face for what seems like another hour. But good to see you, follow Eve. Excellent painter. Excellent artiste. I think I met you through, uh, through Jafar, right? But shouts to you. A bit harsh there with that value. Be a little bit careful. But no, I'd never had the same kind of flair for, for engineering. It's for very specific things. But yeah, I didn't uh, really give too much of a shit um, for my engineering work. But, you know, it's a much safer option than art, so which is why I stuck with it, got my degrees. Right now, um, I have the chance to, you know, give this a, give this a chance, right? Because even if it doesn't work out, uh, I'm, I can get employment still. Like, I, I'm not going to be homeless. So... Let's give it one last shot, right? Let's give the art school thing a try. And if that doesn't work, then it's okay. At least I say I, I, I can I can rest assured of the fact that I actually did try when I could with the time given to me. That's like an idea behind this whole art school thing. Because this is technically the last time. Because after that, I go I get into a job, become a professional uh, in this other field, and it's uh, going to be a while till I have the opportunity to do something like this again. So. I'm just taking the initiative and saying, you know what, let's just try and make this life a little bit, make it make a little bit more sense, right? Let's see. It's going to be harder. It's going to be much more of a challenge, but why not? Uh, why not try? Yeah, there you go. What are you working on, Eve? Show me some work. I want to see. I want some subtle little highlights down there. Let me tell you, there are more than enough people telling me to do the opposite. Let me tell you, there are more than enough people. But at the end of the day, sometimes you just gotta make you gotta make some hard decisions, right? And make some sacrifices. All I gotta say about that. A little bit of a highlight in there. Now we can sculpt the head just a little bit better. There are a bunch of little tiny details and opportunities for interest that we can work on. So let's start adding just a few of those. And we don't need all that many, but we can just put them in simply and they should be able to work. The first thing that we'll do is slightly indicate a little bit of the recess of the orbit right there. So this could be done uh, hardly, but again, not area of interest. So I'll put it in with a bit more softness in there. Let's indicate that. The face itself is a bit desanted just to because I was afraid that it looked too warm in the context of my piece. Uh, at the end of the day, I think I shouldn't have been treating it with that much amount of respect. I think it would be it would have been fine even if it was more uh, saturated. So now that I'm still working on the piece, at this point I can still make the choice of like making some of these planes way more red or way more saturated than they were initially. That's totally an option that we could choose. I relate uh, how you feel. I'm thinking to work a few years drawing outside of work and then give it a shot. Yeah, so I didn't make this decision on the fly. So I spent uh, the best part of a year and a half uh, proving to myself that I can draw consistently, I can improve uh, at a very consistent, very uh, controllable basis. You know, I can, I'm getting commissions, I'm getting all these things that confirm that, okay, my art objectively has some amount of value. So I definitely didn't make the decision over, a, you know, just over overnight. A lot of things that uh, led to this kind of thing. and. Is this system like that to help me convince people as well that needed to uh, be convinced that, uh, hey, I mean, this is not, a, not something I just decided overnight? A lot of things coming to, uh, coming to a head. But yeah, definitely do that. Spend the time and then see where it takes you. But at the end of the day, at least it answers questions, right? It's good to know. Hmm, 
Does that really go that light? Maybe it doesn't. I don't want to excessively go crazy. What's most important in that particular region is not the lights, but it's the occlusion that's around it. That's what's really making it look the way that it does. So focusing more on the occlusion around as opposed to the highlight on the lid itself is what we should be doing. Because the values almost match the um, the understand value of the of the eye the eyebrow. So putting that in is important. I think anyone can do it, it just takes a certain amount of sacrifices. You've got to be ready to spend countless hours practicing. Yeah, definitely. Just it. So the idea is can you convincingly say that uh, something you're able to do? I don't think I can say that because it's what I've been doing. Hopefully it does show. I don't want to make this an excessive statement there, so I don't want it to be excessive, but I want to still be able to relate. So here's how we're going to do it. I want some amount of hardness, so we'll do this much. and also want some amount of softness, so I'll soften it up this way. And that leads me to the effect that I kind of am searching for. Because otherwise it looks way too harsh. I don't like how harsh that looked. I don't want to uh, outline this eye right here. Look, look a bit more natural than that. There we go. It's about the read that I want, almost. I want to make a couple of slight adjustments. I'd like to push this out of the eye. Put everything online these days, and I went to art school and everything, let everything from free online resources. Yeah, so the art school thing is just to give me a little bit of a headway in topics that I'm not comfortable in, and also uh, the big one is to get me uh, into the industry a little bit more, get more contacts. Because, you know, I'm, I'm networking, I know a bunch of artists, I know a bunch of creatives already, but uh, what I don't know are too many people in the actual art industry that, you know, can get me jobs. So that's what I think is going to benefit me the most. But yeah, I do the, uh, the legwork already. Emails and signing portfolios and all this nonsense already. And I just need to go. See you, Rian. I'm assuming you're going to stream. Have a good one if you do. I think these brushes are really unwieldy when they're small. I gotta remember this. So maybe paint the face in a larger canvas and then downsize because it's getting very hard. Like you see, I'm kind of working places for a little bit longer than you, you expect me to because I'm not getting the mark that I want to because the brush behaves really weirdly because of the, uh, the dynamics. I could, at this point, I think it's uh, sensible to shift the, uh, the brush back into something that works a little bit better uh, when it's smaller. But we'll just we'll just stick it out. We'll just stick it out. Let's see if it's possible. And if anything, the incidental nature of it will kind of help us. Um, it's got a unique kind of read painting. Okay. Well, I'm comfortable enough to push the saturation. In certain areas, is that about where I wanted to go? No, I think a little bit more. And this way seems a bit better. Most companies have public emails, you can send stuff too. So just get good enough and send your stuff and you should be able to land a job. Yeah, but in the uh, in the meantime, I got to do something. Is uh, the money that I already have in my my account is, it's, I mean, it's enough for me to live comfortably, to have lived comfortably in the Netherlands while I was studying um, my engineering, but the issue is, is that it's almost run out, so I have to rely on uh, other people for financial stability, and those other people always require some amount of proof that I'm actually, I have some guarantee of um, making it into somewhere, right? So in that respect, very, very strong thing to say. I can't just say, hey, just trust me, you know? Just trust me, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get good and I'm gonna get hired. It's a difficult case to make. Let's toss it to a bit more red and uh, we'll paint that with a bit more hardness.
Okay, let's get the shape over here. Just improve the quality of it a bit more. Make it a bit more sensible. Also, slightly affect the contouring. Nose, where did that line come from? There you are. Right. I just hate that when that happens. A random line from nowhere. We're almost done with this. Thankfully, I do have backups, which is why I'm not going insane on Twitch and being like, Yo, just fucking donate to me, I have no money. And I have a lot of backups, so hopefully. It doesn't come to that, but... Uh, yeah, I'm still not gonna go crazy with the, uh, with the Twitch thing. I'm gonna keep it as it is. Since you are going into the concert audience, you should probably start doing more of your own stuff rather than reference studies. I do plenty of my own stuff, yeah. I'm, my entire portfolio is original. But for stream, I gotta do studies, right? But yeah, every single thing in my, uh, my design portfolio is completely original. This is a, this is a study stream, right? So it doesn't make any sense for me to do it. Well, every time, every time occasionally I will jump into the idea of uh, doing design, like I did design on Saturday, I think. But uh, studies is what got me to my uh, my current ability, so or my current skill level. So there's no way I'm going to shirk it. I had a random line from nowhere. <laughs> Under export, that's definitely a concern. Yeah. Yeah, but different. Instagram's not a portfolio, just say it's just where I post uh, post studies. This is my my design work. Let me show you. Yeah, my scuffed portfolio. <laughs> and this is a uh, this is design work. I'm just gonna grab some random shit that's in my folder. <laughs> Fridge magnet. <laughs> you remember? That kind of stuff is uh, what I work through, work on throughout the day. You can link that portfolio so you can take a look. I don't have it uh, uploaded anywhere. It's on like I guess Imgur, but uh, I don't have the link on hand. This is not something I'm posting, right? Because uh, I it's still very much I'm working on every page almost simultaneously. So the pages are all laid out. So I have all my orthos. I have all my everything like is basically laid out. And uh, just need to just working on a few specifics, a few callouts here and there. And also, of course, need to add a bunch of value in painting, especially in the three fourths. Uh, I have not even begun to detail my three fourths. But these are the authors for my three mains, main characters right here. Yeah, but this is my uh, concept art stuff. Well, entertainment design stuff, technically. Not really concept art. This stuff over here. So yeah, I do much and more. My entire day kind of goes into this. And that's just the few hours that I study on stream is uh, when I'm doing something else. And sometimes I do painting, but... Because I'm going to be working on this after I finish stream. And some creature designs from Saturday stream right there. You should take some of this stuff further. Yeah, like I said, these are all pages in development, which is why they're not posted anywhere. I'm compiling them into a big, big old thing. 
do a big old thing and then that's going to be the uh, submission to art center in october and a lot of this a lot of things that i developed for this project i'm going to be using in other projects so some of these some of my character sketches i really really like so i'll just be keeping that in my running portfolio likely. so yeah that's the that's why i have i have that base covered infinite destiny good to see you man Doing quite well. We're just uh, finishing up this little armor study that we did. Just putting uh, a face on this lovely, lovely armor. Good to see you. Hope you're having a good day. Oh, we just hit two hours. Shit. I need to do a little bit of uh, leg work here and I'm done. This is amp that specular here. These little fine details. I'm not quite sure I'm the biggest fan. I'm going to have to do some modification to these brushes. Because I'm not quite a fan of this house. Specific. I want to be, but can't. And I guess that's kind of the point with uh, with oil tools. But the thing about that is that I think they're not they don't expect me to paint on the canvas of this, that's this small because I need to paint very very small for me to be able to stream other work. I wish you would start streaming in a different time zone from October. Wink, wink. <laughs> well, we'll see. What time zone would you like me to stream at? Because right now this is I start streaming at about eight my time and I finish at about midnight to one. So I, I'm in India right now, so that's about when I finish. But I could also stream in the morning. I don't really mind, because uh, because of how inconsistent and erratic my streaming schedule has been in the past. I have viewers at just about every time I ever stream, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so I don't mind changing it up, but uh, I, I hope this is the majority. From uh, in Pasadena, well, the submission is um is in October. The classes start from January. But yeah, I mean, if I get in, if I get in, and if I can pay for it, which is another big concern, but we're not going to talk about that. If I can pay for it and get in, um, yeah, well, of course, I'll, if I have time to stream, I will stream. It would be in the uh, corresponding time zone, of course. Okay, let's put some finishing touches on this and we're pretty much done so maybe a little bit too uh, complex in the face i think i would have liked to simplify a little bit form and uh, would have been more successful because i was like maybe we could do it in the a lot of time but nah, it wasn't a bad idea also the beginning i gotta think about using a more saturated base because the one that i used on this one is a little bit too too desat so either use more saturated colors to begin with or block things out with more saturated colors and then um, turn it back down if required. It's a, a bit too desat on the face, a bit too desat. So the way I would offset this in my general process is I would use airbrushing to get just a mild amount of saturation near some of the more important zones. And I can also do something like that in this study, for example. I can use um, really mild pastel and apply just little, little bits of like saturation in certain areas, right? For example, on this transition, I can throw just a little bit of orange like that, just to liven it up. But things like this can really liven up the face. Uh, but again, I wanted to do this strictly with the uh, oil pack just to see like what the limitations are. Um, so yeah, not really uh, the best for that particular purpose, but it's good to know these kind of things. It's good to explore it. I guess now we know. But how are you doing, Infinite Dest uh, Destiny? Good to see you, man. Hopefully everything is treating you just fine as well. If not, have uh, faith, ability to overcome, surmount, not bad whatsoever. Oh. I was doing a study and forgot to set the timer. <laughs> the punishment is death. Yeah, when I go really small like this, it becomes really, 
really unreliable from the strokes. But that's alright. But I do hope I do have the time to stream because if I get into something like Art Center or Feng Zhu, it's gonna be awful. It's gonna, the time's gonna be awful. Like there's gonna be so much, so much time spent uh, working, which I look forward to heavily because that sounds like heaven uh, to me. Working just for <laughs> for art the entire day—it's what I'm doing right now. And I really enjoy it, but at the same time, uh, it's not gonna be always things that I enjoy. I'm not naive about it. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of things that I don't enjoy, and in that case, I'm gonna be busy trying to work on that as well. So I, I do hope that I do hope I can continue to stream because it's a, it's a big part of my life right now. Like maintaining the Discord and answering the questions on on the Instagram and stuff like that. Like I really enjoy doing this, uh, but of course, like it's not something that's gonna always uh, be feasible for me to do. But I I do appreciate and I'm very grateful for it and for what uh, what following that I have have gained over the course of the last year and a half of streaming. Maybe a little, little less than that. I started streaming seriously September last year, so. I was streaming from July, but not that seriously. And we're almost at that uh, 2000 mark, I think. We're at uh, nearly 1800. That's been kind of cool. Really surpassed my expectations there. Almost done. You can throw a couple of lines on the hair, just to, uh, to finish. Because things are kind of rough right now. It's a big question to do this or to not do this, because... Honestly, you can go either way. Like, Sergeant would never do this, and Booger would always do this. So, it depends. It depends on what kind of finish you're going for. I'll go somewhere in between. Some indication of, uh, of stroke. Enough of detail, but no actual detail painted. That's the way to go. Go deeper and darker in a few of these areas as well. Uh, something a bit seems a bit unresolved with that forehead. Maybe the saturation. So let's up that a little bit. Maybe develop that a little bit further. Looks better. Anything else I want to add before we call it? I think I'm happy with this. I got two hours, seven minutes. Nice. Of course, the little things are always going to bother me, but at the end of the day, you got to call it when you call it, right? Very cool. Let's uh, put that inscription on here. Thanks, guy. This was a fun one. I really enjoy the armor on this one. The face is kind of eh, but uh, armor, pretty pog. Some of these small marks are getting way too brushy for me. And what's happening is that the because of the size of the of the, of the um, file, some of the like interesting marks become like average in a really poor way, and it makes things look like way too like micro Minecrafty than I than I would like. So I don't like that the effect that's uh, that's showing up. It's a little bit bothersome. But yeah, it's okay. Dude, I hate it when my, my uh, signature is that and bright. I just want it to be a little, little small thing on the side. Just so I know myself. There you go. Fun? Anybody else did this study, by the way? I didn't ask. But, uh, if you did, please say something in the chat. Because sometimes people do the study and they don't mention anything. And I forget to check, being the dumbass that I am. So I think uh, one of the most successful armor studies we've done. It's been, it's been really good. 
compare the other ones. So definitely getting a lot more comfortable, especially with the brush set. This is the second armor piece that we've done with the new brush pack, with the oils that is. I think this one's uh, yeah, a lot more comfortable than the first one. The first one I was just really trying to figure stuff out. I did, I did this quick one as well on stream. You did power? Cool, I want to see. So that's one, that's two, and we have this one, which is three. So definitely improving with the uh, with the tools. Very fun. Let me see, Pyron. You up on me? Dude, nicely done. Hell yeah. Does Paris work? It worked, dude. Really nice job. Had a social office in the chat. Dude, Barry, you've been on, you've been on the uh, the study ground for a, for a while now on the Discord. It's been really good having you. Love that person on the um, on the swords. I think I like yours a little bit better than mine. The way that you handled this area. Just be a little bit uh, careful about the crispness, especially down here, because you want to kind of maintain that attention up here, because I think you're rendering this area, especially especially the area that I liked. Pretty good, I like it a lot. And you're not being afraid of that specular. Is really what I want to see. So in terms of like the fundamental idea of you know does it look like armor it definitely does so strong usage of that uh, that logic that we talked about initially on the stream i kind of want to see that same likeness over here as well because again they're looking at the same source so because this this specular or sorry this is going to be reflecting that same light source and that same angle is going to be on most of these plates especially the top plate so keep that in mind so if this is going to show a certain source this has to show the same source, so it's going to have that same light quality. So don't be afraid of just taking values from here and putting the same value there. You know, that's perfectly fair. It's a, it's a fine thing to do. Let me not do this on stream because I wanted to post from my gallery, but I have no idea how many <laughs> how many NSFW stuff or paintings is in my uh, in my references folder because I do a lot of gesture work and a lot of the gesture work is from. Nudes. But yeah, that's a kind of idea. Just a, like a logical consistency. You see how I did that over here? So it's like the same value. Just brought up there. I hope that makes some amount of sense. But cool. Alright. Well, that's all the painting that I want to be doing on stream today because I have anything more off stream still and on in the morning. So <laughs> I'm going to have to call it right now, guys. But that was really fun. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's paint along. A lot of good information about armor. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll get something more done with the blob study. And I can give you more information on that. But we'll have a big recap on this piece. Because I will get it finished before the last, before the next stream. We'll have a big recap on this, on this piece. Hopefully I get uh, all the faces well done. Uh, the, okay, Nas, you're going to have to forgive me. But I need to, I need to tone you down, okay? Both of you guys. Yuri and Nas need to be toned down, because again, I can't, can't take away from my main character, alright? I'm sorry I have to do this to you. But um, yeah, I'm gonna be, maybe I'll leave you with some amount of value, but I will grayscale you a little bit more, so you don't have that much vibrancy. That's how I tackle the piece, but I want to shift the lighting in this piece entirely. I want to make it more backlit, uh, as opposed to direction. Don't turn us down. No, I gotta, I gotta. Turn us, <laughs> turn us up. You guys are going to be the main characters. Maybe, I'll consider it, alright? I'll think about it really hard. Alright, for now, I hope you guys enjoyed the process behind this painting over here. I think uh, successful. I don't do too many longer pieces, this is two hours, and uh, yeah, that's a little bit long for me, but I hope you like it. Uh, it was definitely fun to, uh, to paint, and I will send you over to somebody else, right? And thanks for those, uh, those subs today. Very kind, I've been getting like a sub stream. That's uh, definitely more than average. Very appreciated. All goes towards painting for or paying for tutorials and Gumroad stuff, and also supporting other artists and creative. Like if I ever have, if I ever think I have too much money in the PayPal, I just uh, hand that donation in there for somebody else. All right, let me check. Kazaki, thanks, man. Thanks for hanging out. Who is on? Carl's on. We were in Khan yesterday. 
Brenda is on. I like Brenda a lot. Zan is on. Scoobs is on. I like Scoobs a lot. Cool. You guys have any suggestions? The Nubo Witch is on. The Nubo Witch is fucking fantastic. I'm actually following most of his tutorials right now for character sketching. Solomir, Mirror, how's it going, man? We're about to leave, but we did this one today. I hope you like it. It's a cool little painting. Random? I don't think Azar is on. Oh, do you mean actual random, not Mr. Random Knees? Let's, uh, you know who we're gonna raid? We're gonna raid Grigori Peppo. I haven't raided Peppo before, but I want to. Thanks, Omer. Peppo's awesome. Really, really good artist. A lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge to disseminate. So usually I raid uh, people that are doing studies, but I think you have plenty to, plenty to learn from this man. I have plenty to learn. Definitely. Uh, go be kind to him. Definitely go hit that uh, follow button when you see him and ask him a bunch of questions. And I will be right there with you. So, had a good stream. I certainly did, and I will catch you tomorrow for some more studies. Cheers. Have a good one.